Hey YouTube, uh, welcome to my channel. I, if you haven't been here before, I just finished a new painting that I actually had on my um, last exhibition. I just took it home and I worked some more with it because, and I had to put on a finishing furnace. I went over it a little bit and I just want to show you some of the textures, how it's painted and uh, yeah you see what I do to build the light is the same thing I kind of tend to build a lot of textures it's a very cool face, it turned out very nice and you can see all the textures I work with and and um, all the brush strokes that I use to build up all the different points of light that makes it into a see here it's very thick um, and yeah that I guess it's the classical way to do it to get that sense of sculpture in it I went over this face and I think it turned also out quite well. Um, yeah, it's quite bluish. It's a little bit uh, more red in it in real life than you see here in the in the. Let's see. It's a fun by lens that. Auto scan, maybe uh, it's a little bit more, as I say, warmer in reality. And I think I also want to show it with a frame. I use very nice framing because I think it's a good idea to hold the painting like in your hand in a way, or lock it in as you are looking through a window. And you get more depth and you show where it ends and where it starts. And I like the aesthetics of it. I like the pathos of these frames. And also, if I could actually make, got made classical, classical uh, framing, like you see in the big museums I would have done that but you don't get it anymore this too became quite nice and it's a little bit rough rough painted it's not that detailed in the dress and stuff I just use a lot of brush strokes so I concentrate about the faces and to get that right but well it's two files uh, it's one file from sketch to finish sketch and then it's this this one and you will find the second second video or the first video in the end of this this um, video after it's finished uh, so I hope you enjoy the process and get something out of it so, <clears throat> as usual, I would ask you to share my videos and subscribe to my channel. You can also donate on my channel if you like to give something back. Uh, so, with this, I rest my case and I hope, as I said, that you get something out of it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, anyone who's been at Hay on My over the last 10 years will know that this is about as close and as good as it gets for me. Um, you can fool the grand committee, you can bid for sainthood, but you fuck with a hitch at your peril. Please welcome Christopher Hitchens!
So, um, it's a fairly slow day at the shrink, and uh, this guy comes in, hasn't made an appointment, he's shown in, and he, he just stands there in front of the shrink's desk going, <laughs> panting like that. And the shrink says, um, can I help you? Choosing his words with care. The other stands there going, <laughs> like that, panting. The shrink thinks, give, give it time. Asks again if he can be of assistance, and I, shaking and panting. They do it a few more times, and finally the guy says, I'm just a dog, that's all I am. Nothing but a dog is all. And the shrink says, well, you want to get on the couch? The guy says, not allowed on the fucking couch. <laughs> but you like that, okay, well, I just want to see how easily pleased you were. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to my more downsized cabaret and team uh, venue. I have been hoping to pull the Van Morrison crowd, but this is probably more choosy. Um, Peter may have told you that what I really live for now is stand-up and also karaoke. <laughs> we don't have a karaoke machine here, you'll be, you'll be sorry to find out. I did karaoke in North Korea. There's only one pub in North Korea. It's only just opened and I, I was one of the opening headliners in Pyongyang Karaoke Club. A stone-faced, Aztec-faced audience of paid members of the Korean Workers' Party. So I'm not shy in front of this audience at all. You can't bomb like you can bomb in Pyongyang. And I did, um, I gave them um, Proud Mary and uh, girls just want to have fun. <laughs> I don't want you to think I can't sing uh, without a karaoke machine. I can lift a good job in the city, working for the man every night and day. But it would be better with music, I know. And this, the theme of this evening is somewhat melancholy. I can sing an old dirge from Dublin which goes, you may know it, um, it was early last September, as near as I remember, I was walking down the street in drunken pride, when I fell into the gutter thinking thoughts I dared not utter, and a pig came up and lay down by me side, as I lay there in that gutter thinking thoughts I dared not utter, a fair young maid came by, and she did say, You can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. And at that, the pig got up and walked away. <laughs> and the pig got up and slowly walked away. Now, that was the karaoke bit. But I, the stand-up story is, in a way, sadder still, I was a finalist in the Washington Celebrity comedy improv a couple of years ago and I was beaten and I would say beaten badly and unfairly by um, Senator Joseph Lieberman <laughs> then later to become one of the most disastrous vice presidential candidates in American history and he openly cheated, he used cue cards prepared for him by his staff and the fix was in from the start because they were hoping obviously for someone famous to win so they get publicity for their ghastly charity that we were doing it for and, but I realized that even with cue cards, and even though he looks like uh, a leprechaun, Senator Lehman could have in him the makings of a, a, what we call in the United States a cat still comedian. Perhaps some of you know what I mean, the, the cat stills with old Jewish retirement homes where ham comics, I suppose they don't call themselves ham comics, um, <laughs> go and do their stuff. If you've seen Dirty Dancing, you know the sort of scene. The guy, guy comes on, he says, uh, so I, I finally found a, a girl who's just like my mother. Looks like her, sounds like her, acts like her, even dresses like her. So I take her home. My father doesn't like her. That's Catskill comedy. You can do it in your sleep. Um, I personally am of the opinion that a joke is not a joke unless it's very piercingly at somebody's expense. The uses of humiliation should not be neglected. Taste is not really a consideration.
um, was going the Los Angeles freeway, trying to get home. He's stuck in the most appalling traffic on the freeway. But he has a car phone. Dials his number while still driving. Ring, ring. Phone answers. Si. Sí. He says, Teresa. It's the, it's the Spanish maid. Si, sí, si, sí, senor. Uh, can you get my wife on the line? Quick. I'm in a hurry. Si, sí, senor. Trots away. Comes back. Uh, wife in, in Belgium, senor. So we'll get her out of there. I need her in a hurry. She comes back after a bit more trotting in and out. Says, wife in bedroom with other other hombre, senor. Says, what? Where are you? Are you in the den? See? Si. Okay, you by my desk? See? Si. Pull over the left hand drawer. So down in there? See? Si, okay. Do this. Take the gun, go upstairs, shoot her, shoot him, get on the bedroom extension. Long wait. Finally, the extension. He's still fighting the most appalling traffic with her. And trying to hold the phone. Long way, she comes uh, to, on, the, on the line, the extension's picked up. So is it, see, si, senor, have you done it? See, si. but they're both dead. See, si, senor, bread shots. See, si. okay, now I want you to open the window and throw them both out into the swimming pool. No, no swimming pool here, senor. Is this two, one, three, five? <laughs> It's going to be at somebody's expense. <laughs> I'm just giving you my sort of ABC of how to do this, kind of if you ever stuck for a routine. Um, the doctor, look, the doctor calls the guy at work. This has never happened before. And says, can you come and see me on the way home? It's really important. He stopped by and the guy says, yeah, I can't, why, why? I can't tell you, I cannot tell you on the telephone. So the guy stops by his doctor's office on the way back uh, home and the doctor says, look, I don't know how to tell you this. And it, well, it should never have happened at my office, okay? Uh, sit down, sit down. Um, it's about your wife, it's not you, don't worry. Well, callously, I think. Um, the man by now is sort of slightly on the edge of his chair and says, oh, it's the tests. We, we, you know, she was by recently, we took some tests, we sent the samples off, and this really shouldn't, he goes on about it. Shouldn't happen, in my hopes, can't happen. But the samples got mixed up and they've come back and it's terrible. I mean, we don't know which one is the right one. And, but I can narrow it down for you. The guy says, well, so what, what, is the, what is the bottom line here? The doctor says, well, she's either got AIDS or she's got Alzheimer's. I don't know which it is. And there's a, do you have any suggestions, Doctor? And the doctor says, yeah, I do actually have a suggestion. That's why I want you to come by on your way home. When you get home, suggest a drive to the old girl. If she says yes, get her in the car, drive as far out of the city as you can, and then park the car, and then suggest a stroll, like in the old days, and walk her as far as you can away from that car. And when you've got her as far as you can away from it, run and jump back in the car and speed away and leave her there. And if she finds her own way home, never fuck her again. <laughs> I told you, taste is not a factor. You have to keep... It has to be at somebody's expense. But if you... Now, suppose you're doing a nicer audience than apparently you are. A sort of more tender... You can always try a little recitation. People don't teach poetry anymore, you know what this? No one's taught to memorize anything. If you can recite even a little, you can, you can impress people. You can stir them. You can move them. Do you know the story? It's an Aesop story of the, the fox and the raven. The, the bird, the raven has the cheese and the fox wants it. How does the fox get the raven to give up the cheese? You know the Aesop story. Well, the fox flatters the raven and um, this isn't a joke. Flatters the raven to thinking that it could sing. It's a great singer, and he opens his beak, and the cheese falls to the fox. It's an old Aesop story. Done into a beautiful uh, piece of doggerel by an unknown American poet. I wish I knew who this was. It appears in the very few anthologies that I have, as written by Anonymous. It's called The Sycophantic Fox and the Gullible Raven. And it goes like this that, um, A raven sat upon a tree. And not a word he spoke, for his beak 
contained a piece of brie, or maybe it was Roquefort. We'll make it any kind you please. At all events, it was a cheese. Beneath the tree's umbrageous limb, a hungry fox sat, smiling. He saw the raven watching him, and spoke in tones beguiling. Jadimir, quoth he, tombeau plumage. The wish was simply persiflage. Two things there are, no doubt you know, to which a fox is used. A rooster that is bound to crow, a crow that's bound to roost. And whichsoever he espies, he tells the most unblushing lies. Sweet fowl, he said, I hear you're more than merely natty. Indeed, I hear you sing to beat the band and Adelina Patty. Pray render with your golden tongue a bit from Go to Demera. This subtle speech was aimed to please the bird, and it succeeded. He thought no crow in all the trees could sing as well as he did. In flattery, completely doused, he gave the jewel song from Faust. But gravitation's law, of course, as Isaac Newton showed it, exerted on the cheese its force, and elsewhere soon bestowed it. In fact, there is no need to tell what happened when to earth it fell. I blushed to add that when the bird took in the situation, he uttered one emphatic word, unfit for publication. The fox was greatly startled, but he merely sighed and answered, tut. The moral is, a fox is bound to be a shameless sinner. And also, when the cheese comes round, you know it's after dinner. But what is only known to few, the fox is after dinner too. Now, you can charm, as I say, less or more civilized audience than yourself with stuff like that, but what they want, they like a bit of poetry and a bit of balladry. What they want is filth, you'll find. <laughs> and here I think, that the limerick form is probably the handiest. It's the, the most easy and pungent delivery system for the smut that your customers really want. And there's a story within a story about the usefulness of a limerick and also how it can go wrong. And remember I'm telling you, this is boot camp for, for a stand-up. There's a boring guy who knows he's boring and he, it's come round to his turn to give the toast at the annual dinner of his ghastly professional association, whatever it is. And he knows how to say a few remarks and to thank last year's retiring chairman and all this kind of thing. He feels he needs a bit of zip and brio and espiglerie, as um, Bertie was the use to call it. So he stops in his club on the way and he says to a friend, a rather gamey friend at the bar, you wouldn't have such a thing as a kind of joke about your person, would you, that I could use to amuse the customers? And the guy said, well, I've got a reasonably filthy limerick for you. Quite easy to remember. I says, all right, I'll buy it. And I says, okay, it goes like this. There was a young fellow named Skinner who took a young girl out to dinner. Dinner went fine. By half past nine, it was dinner, not Skinner, the dinner. Skinner, the dinner. They repeated it, got it more or less by heart, thought it was the kind of thing that would please his clientele, and was muttering it to him to himself all through the dinner, knowing it's his turn soon. Wondering if he got it right. It came his turn to be said, heard rather a good joke uh, on the way here. Picked it up at the club, as a matter of fact. Conscious of a slight unease, he said, um, there was a young fellow named Tupper. <laughs> Rallying, who took the young girl out of the supper? He's got it, he's back, he's back on form. <laughs> He said the supper went fine, and by half past nine, he was up and not tough as another fucking fellow called Skinner. <laughs> this is where you can make your bloomer, ladies and gentlemen. The, um, there are various forms of sanity that the limerick can take. The best ones, I think, are episcopal or liturgical, as in, um, uh, a vice both obscene and unsavory holds the Bishop of Barking in slavery. With lascivious howls, he deflowers young owls that he lures to an underground aviary. <laughs> or, there was a young lady of K 
Pugh, who remarked as the curate withdrew, the vicar is quicker and slicker and thicker and longer and stronger than you. <laughs> there are less hardcore ones like the, the um, Lady of Chichester, whose tits made the saints in their niches to one morning at Matins, her breast in white satins made the bitch of Chichester's britches to her. <coughs> and then there's, there's the more raw stuff like um, uh, the bishop of central Japan used to roger himself with a fan. And when taxed with these acts, he replied, it contracts and it expands so much more than a man. Or, um, the Anglican Dean of Hong Kong. The Anglican Dean of Hong Kong had a thing that was nine inches long and he thought that the waiters were admiring his gaiters when he went to the loo. He was wrong. <laughs> that, I'm glad you noticed, that's, that's by W.H. Jordan, who did a wonderful, of, the, of whom there exists a marvelous collection of un, unpublished, mainly gay, uh, filth. And then there's, uh, Clean ones. Um, when Gauguin was visiting Fiji, he observed things are different here, e.g. <laughs> While Tahitian skin calls for tan spread on thin, you can splot it on here with a squeegee. That's clean, I think you're agreeing. A uh, young engine driver called Hunt was given an engine to shunt, saw a runaway truck by yelling out, duck saved the life of the fellow in front. That's clean too. As opposed to say, uh, I was told by an oil man who, who'd known her of a girl from Red Gulch, Arizona, the inside of whose twat was so scorchingly hot that it lit his Corona Corona. That's a dirty one. The, the great genius of of this genre, now that Kingsley Amos and Philip Welkin have passed on and no longer exchange them and refine and polish and, and lovingly um, make them fouler and nastier and meaner, is uh, Rob Compass, who has, um, I have the honor to say I'm uh, his friend, he keeps the, the limerick form well burnished and can do it in any number of ways, as dirty as you like, as clean as you like, or as literary as you like. And I thought I'd, um, share with you, uh, those of you who know as you like it, will remember the uh, seven ages of man speech and the, the evolutions that the man performs from being a baby, using puking in his mother's arms to the lover sighing like furnace to the soldier seeking the bubble's reputation even in the canvas mouth, you, you know it, right? It's quite a long and intricate speech. It can be done in a limerick form like this, in seven ages. Uh, first you have puking and mewing, then very pissed off with your schooling, then fucks and then fights and then judging chaps' rights, then sitting in slippers, then drooling. <laughs> that was a, a moment's work for, for Congress. Uh, but I thought I wanted to end on a more elevated note because I think in the spirit of give and take that is hay in the democratic atmosphere. I want to be at your mercy. I want to be anybody's. I want to be yours very soon. Um, but I want to I want to end on a suitably melancholy note and say you can ask me anything you like. Anything you want at all. And I promise that my answer will be completely truthful. It's a dare. Um, but the the elevated Shakespearean note on which I wish to end was this. Um, is, is with my favorite sonnet. Um, and I'll tell you why it's favorite in a second. Uh, you, may, you may know the one I mean. It's um, when in disgrace with, um, with fortune of men's eyes, I all alone but weep my outcast name. And trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, Desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least. When in this state, myself almost despising, happily, I think, on thee and then my soul. Like 
Lark at break of day arising, quits southern earth and sings at heaven's gate for thy sweet love remembered. Such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. And I like this sonnet above rubies, not because of the wonderful play on state and king and the political and social subtext, as we've learned to call it, but because of the early bit. Marvellous though that subtext is there, where, where he's saying, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. What do we learn from this? There was somebody, there was some guy, who Shakespeare envied. He thought, I wish I had this man's talent. I wish I was as good as him. I wish I was as smart. I wish I had his wit. I wish I had his gift. I can't rest until I know who that guy was. I want very, very, very badly to know. Until I know, I can know no rest. Which is why, filthy and disgusting though it is, my stand-up routine will always have this dying fall. And um, so does the karaoke, um, as you will, will one day find out. So I'm at your mercy now, ladies and gentlemen. It was very nice of you to come. You can ask me anything you want. I'm anybody's, I'm yours. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't point in case you think I've filled the place with a clack of sycophantic toadying friends who will ask me soft questions. Now, can you give it some Wellington boot? Bring it up a bit. Carney O'Brien, what are you saying? She's shy. Um, I've just been in your other um, performance tonight, which I actually took very seriously because for the first time, uh, because for the first time in a long time, I heard somebody from the left exposing something practical and useful, and then I see you here in another role um, playing the clown. So, exactly where do you stand? <laughs> The reason I like um, P.G. Woodhouse and Oscar Wilde is because they teach you to, te to take um, frivolous things seriously. And, well, and serious things frivolously. I'm sorry, I was you were waiting for the other shoes to come. Um, uh, it's all a complete farce, you understand. We're born into a losing struggle. I, I've been into this minutely, I've investigated the road up ahead. No one comes out of this a winner. <laughs> In the meantime, I think one must show some contempt and some defiance. And the best means of, of doing that, as I know, are irony and obscenity. Which is why... The, which is why it was a mistake for that guy to ask me about those slut Dixie chicks. And, uh, <laughs> and the hideous holocaust to which they've been subjected. Don't try me too high, is all I'm saying. Uh, I may look friendly and weak and so on, but I'm, I can have a mean streak a mile wide. Um, oh, from that, should I point? You, yeah. Hold it. I can't see, uh, if you think I can I've got see the mic. you. If you think I can see you, you're making a huge mistake. I can't see a thing. Apart from the Dixie Chicks, oh, apart from the Dixie Chicks remark, what's the most offensive thing that anyone could say to an audience at the Hay Festival sponsored by The Guardian? <laughs> um, the ketchup in school lunches is a vegetable. <laughs> It is too a vegetable. And, the, and uh, since it's the Guardian, if you're rich, it's your own fault. Yeah. 
But I'm going to let you decide, man. Actually, give it to people you can reach. Um, I can't. I can't really can't say a thing. With or without the shades. Hi, Angel. Yes, you can. <laughs> By all means, by all means, you can. You may, I mean to say. Hello. Hello yourself. <laughs> it's all absurd. And for sure, and admirer of Woodhouse, but Woodhouse is quite literary. Is there any any other absurdities you get off on, like um, Stephen, Leacock, Edward, Lear, Lewis, Carroll? Is there absurdity there that you find useful as well? If you challenged me to do Jabberwocky, I could do it. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. But I don't like the Reverend Dodgson otherwise, and I think uh, Edward Lear is a complete and utter pain in the ass, and, and has ruined the limerick form for all time by neglecting the beauty of its of its punchline. Um, you want you want Jabberwocky? You are easily pleased. Uh, oof. Um, <laughs> it was brilliant and the slightly toes to Gary Gimble in the wave. Or Mimsy with Borogos and the Mem Raths Al Grey. Some people really get off on this. Um, let me see. Beware the travel walk, my son. The jaws that bite, the teeth that catch, beware the job job bird and shun the frumious and a snatch. He took his vocal sword in hand. Long time the maxim foe he sought. Then rested he by a something fucking yum yum tree <laughs> and stood a while and thought and as in uffish thought he stood the jabberwock with eyes of flame came woodfling through the tulgy wood and, and burbled as it came one two one two and through and through the vocal blade went snicker snack he left it dead and with his head with its head he went galumphing back and hast thou slain the jabberwock come to my arms my beamish boy Oh, frab just day, kalukale, he chortled in his joy. It was brilliant on the slightly toes of Garen Gimble in the wave, or Mimsy with the Vargos and the Moan Rath's out grey. Easily pleased. <laughs> the Roman, I'm more interested in the, in the pederastic side of the Roman Dodson, to be absolutely honest with you. What you want is to run into a filthy schoolgirl with a dire shortage of pocket money. And that's what he thought of a Victorian bad dire shortage of pocket money. And that's what he thought of a Victorian bad as well. Woodhouse and... Have I ever shared with you my feeling that there's a secret code that links Woodhouse to Wilde? No one's ever heard me do this before? Good, I thought that's what I was afraid of. How many is that? <laughs> you others want to hear me? Yeah. Okay, what's the first, they'll know, what's the first lie of the importance of being honest? What's the very first lie? They don't remember, you see what, you fucking waste your time with some of these <laughs> paying customers. Um, you do your best, you give it everything, and they don't remember. The first line, look at the stage directions in, of the importance of being honest. It says the curtain rises on, it actually says Half Moon Street. Uh, an apartment in Half Moon Street. So you know you're in a bachelor flat. You would know anyway you're in a bachelor flat in Mayfair or Piccadilly of a frivolous young man. That's clear from the curtain up and it's in the stage directions. A butler is laying out the tea things. And in the next room, you can't see him, but somebody or her, you don't know who it is, but someone's playing the piano in a rather banal way. This goes on for a bit and then the music stops. And into the room walks Algernon Moncrief, who, with a start, realizes the butler's been there all along, didn't know he was there, and says, this is the first line, uh, did you hear what I was playing, Lane? And Lane says, I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I think it's a very promising start, myself. And then, what happens next? Well, what, what happens next is one of the most terrifying aunts in English fiction sweeps in. Lady Bracknell, Aunt Augusta, and tyrannizes the whole place, and then what happens to silly girls come in and another silly boy, and there's a huge argument about who's going to marry who, who's going to get permission from what relative, can they afford it, sundered hearts, 
an intricate and pointless mystery. And then they moved to the country where it's ridiculous rural deans and mad governesses. And then at the end, all the hearts and flowers and all sounded hearts reunited. That is the map. The importance of being honest in three acts is the map of the entire social and moral and romantic universe of Fiji Woodhouse. I submit. Butler, ridiculous young man, absurd aunt. I mean, I, actually, I said Aunt Augusta was terrifying. Graham Greene's travels with my aunt, by the way, you notice his Aunt Augusta. Um, that's Lady Bracknell. Uh, not as terrifying as Bertie's Aunt Agatha, it has to be said. The one who kills rats with her teeth and eats broken bottles at the light of the moon. <laughs> aunt calling to our aunt like mastodons bellowing across the primeval swamp. But pretty terrifying. And so, here's yeah, an interesting thing. You can trace, people have traced, buffs have traced, references, very learned ones by Woodhouse, who read almost everything, to almost a hundred authors. Uh, not all of them English, he's very widely read in general. And so he spent uh, years of his life, decades of his life, in the comic and light opera theatre. There's not one reference in anything he ever writes, whether it's a letter, a play, a novel, a short story, to Oscar Wilde. It's not possible he didn't know who Oscar Wilde was, but he never mentions it. I rest my case. You see, you have to take frivolous things seriously. to say that you are the highlight of Hay for me every year and I think your mind is absolutely incredible and you're a joy to listen to. Um, Hi. But I would like to... <laughs> but I would like to know... Um, no, you can't buy me a drink. Well, two of you. <laughs> um, I would That's like to, off. <laughs> I would like to know if there's anything about which you don't have an opinion. And also, if you can't ask that question, what is your favourite PG Woodhouse line? Ah. Probably the best, I'll get to the, uh, if you, I'll save up your first question for a bit. The best, probably, you know, is, is when Bertie can tell that Jesus is in a bad mood. <clears> he <throat> doesn't know why. And he said, I wouldn't, he said, I wouldn't exactly say he was disgruntled, but he wasn't exactly gruntled either. <laughs> I think that packs quite a lot into a short line. Um, the imperishable scene, the, the, the summer, I think, of Woodhouse's work is in the Code of the Worcesters. The great confrontation with Sir Roderick Spode, the, the fascist leader, and Shrink, um, a megalomaniac who Jeeves tells Bertie has set up a, a movement for the takeover of Britain for a law and order party. It's written in 1936. And G says it's a, it's a Roderick's party and movement, so it's called the, the Black Shorts. <laughs> and Bertie says, that's fine, Jeeves, I can understand all that, but by the way, when you said Black Shorts, you meant shirts, didn't you? And I regret to say so, no. <laughs> um, by the time Sir Roderick formed his movement, the supply of shirts had been exhausted, and uh, his uh, followers paraded Black Shorts. And um, Bertie says, what do you mean they go around in, in footer bags, do they? And uh, Jeeves said, I'm sorry to inform you, sir, that this is the case. And Bertie says, how perfectly foul. Uh, the, the confrontation between him and Sir Robert Spur is, I think, the... You can't do it in a line, but everyone, everyone, should, everyone should read that. That's the best. Yeah, there are a lot of things I know nothing about, and you can tell what they are, because so I don't refer to them. <laughs> so, I'm not going to be caught out like that. I'd like to ask you uh, to comment upon two possibly provocative statements. Uh, the first is, do you, do you agree that the visceral anti-Americanism of the British left comes from their hatred of success? And the second, now that she's dead and about to become a saint, would you care to crack a joke about Mother Teresa? <laughs> I was, um, I'll do this in reverse too, if I may, uh, because I can't wait. Um, I was asked by, I was asked by His Holiness the Pope, I was asked by the Vatican, I'm not, I am not making this up, I was asked to testify 
against her in the sainthood hearings. And I said, yes, I got a letter from the Vatican, I said, I'm, I'm coming, I'm going to be in Rome for as long as you like, and I'll stay for as long as it takes. And I was pretty sure Vanity Fair would spring for this. And they said, there were, I, there were two disappointments. One, they said, no, we'll have a special hearing for you at the Archdiocese of Catholic University in Washington, D.C., which I can see from my windows. So it was a taxi ride to go meet this Monsignor and this hedge priest and this deacon. Um, and the second disappointment was to discover, I didn't know this before, the Office of Devil's Advocate, everyone knows about the Devil's Advocate, right? Advocatus Diaboli, even non-Catholics know about it. The present Pope has scrapped it. There is no longer a dialectical hearing on St. You don't get a prosecuting counsel appointed by the Inferno, by, by Lucifer. <laughs> so, they, instead it's more like a seminar on somebody's ghastly thesis where people compare it. So, I don't know if this is a joke or not, but it's my observation that uh, I became the first person in the history of the Roman Catholic Church to represent the devil pro bono. And for the <laughs> I did it for nothing, and I told them why the old bitch shouldn't be canonized, and, I, and they, they, the other rule they've waived is this. There are two other rules they waived. You're not supposed to start a saint of hearing for seven years after the death so that popular and local superstition don't get command of the process. And you're supposed to have two miracles. And they opened the hearings after three years, so popular and local superstition was still strong, and they found a miracle, which you would if you're looking for one. And it was some poor girl in Bengal who'd, who'd had a pain in her tummy, turned out to be a tumor, and had prayed to Mother Teresa for intercession, and the tumor had gone away. And I would say, I would submit this to you objectively, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. If that, if that doesn't prove it, I don't know what does. But the family of the woman and her physicians later testified, after it had been announced and certified as a miracle, that they knew why it had been cured and they had the operation and the records, medical records to prove it. So they're going to have to find another miracle now, but they will. They, I predict that they will. Anyway, it was, it was a pleasure to, to be of the devil's party, as, um, as uh, Blake said of Milton. Uh, what Blake said of Milton was, he was of the devil's party without knowing it. I was of the devil's party voluntarily. The anti-Americanism of the British left, you really want your last, don't you? <laughs> you insist on a feast of reason and a flow of soul, a gag fest. Um, yeah, there's something pretty lugubrious about the British left, sure, there is. It's because they know they couldn't make it in America, I think. The sad sacks, jealous, and some of them increasingly, I think, anti-cosmopolitan, anti-internationalist, provincial, <coughs> dull, localized, resentful, status quo, boring. Um, on the subject of um, the American Dream, have you ever been offered an endorsement deal by Rothmans or Johnny Walker? And if offered, <laughs> would you take it? Man goes into a bar and says, uh, okay, I'll have a large glass of James Walker, please. The barman says, you mean Johnny Walker? He says, no, not when you know him the way I do. <laughs> well, I've, I've trailed my coat. I mean, I've, I've done my best, uh, but no. Something about me uh, apparently doesn't lead to, to sponsorship, but I, 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 I've promised to keep on trying. I mean, I mean to, 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 to do my bit for it. Christopher, um, I just today I'm way back here. Um, I heard the story secondhand that you actually met Margaret Thatcher and that it was a very sexual experience. Can you, do you remember that? <laughs> There are, almost, there are only two terms in the language that now give me an automatic um, er erection. Which is still the polite word for it, isn't it? One of them is preemptive. That seems to work practically every time. Pr 
preventive use to work, but doesn't now. It takes preemptive to get the real sort of twanging hard on it now. And the other is, oddly enough, and I'll, I'll, I promise I'll give you the truth, the word baroness. Um, I, I went to a party, this is when, this is, must have been the very late 70s, she was only then the leader, newly elected leader of the Conservative Party. And I went to a ghastly party in the, the Rosebury Room of the House of Lords for a terrible book by Lord Butler, formerly Rav Butler, on the history of the Conservative Party. It looked like an fantastically unpromising evening that I had to cover for the, the, the then New Statesman, now I speak of the New Statesman sadly as an interred thing of the past. We're still publishing, I think, trading falsely under uh, the same name. And in this magazine, I had written a few weeks before at the Tory party conference that I thought that the power she had over the men in the Tory leadership was a sexual power. That she had an absolute radiance to her, that she knew exactly how many beans made five, and she'd sized up all of these men completely and bent them to her will. How right can you be, by the way? What happened to Francis Pym? Where is Willie Whitelaw now? Jim Pryor? You wouldn't give ninepence for her batch. She devoured them all. She was a gorgon. And now my opinion, which may be immodest, is this. If in the late 1970s you were the newly elected leader of the Tory party, and the columnist for the main socialist opposition weekly says that, that you're full of sex, it's possible you'll notice it. Or that someone will call it to your attention. At any rate, when we met, and were introduced to this party, she seemed to know me. It's one of those things, it's so hard to define. <laughs> Think of the moment on the tram, the tram in Dr. Zhivago, where just as they brushed it, there's the crackle. I, I can still feel it, it's not that I felt it then. And we got into an argument about what was then Rhodesia and is now Zimbabwe. And is now Zimbabwe. And she took what I thought was a reactionary position on it and I told her that I ran, ran into some Tories in, in my recent trip to Rhodesia would disagree with her and she disagreed with me on a point of fact and wouldn't let go. I was right. On the point of fact I was correct. I insist on this. But she was so stubborn, she wouldn't give way, so finally I thought, okay, give the lady the point. And I said, well, you're probably right. And I inclined, as one does, with as much gallantry as I could muster, to acknowledge it. Now, straightened up again, she said, um, bow lower. <laughs> Um, Bertie Worcester says at one point of someone that he writhed like an electric fan. <laughs> and of another person that uh, he withered like a salted snail. Um, it's difficult to describe which of these would most best describe my reaction, but I found I had no will. <laughs> I bowed low. <laughs> and then I regained, I regained the vertical. And she said, no, no, much lower. <laughs> so, as if I had been possessed, as if my corporeal form was occupied by an alien being, as if I lived only to obey. And by this time, people like Simon Hoggart and James Fenton were clustering around, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I have witnesses now, I, I sort of bent like this. And all the while behind her back, she'd been rolling up the House of Lords order paper of the day into a little tube. And as I did, she stepped smartly behind me and gave me a terrific thwack on what I can describe as my bottom. I straightened up with immense difficulty. And to see her turn away and over her shoulder say, naughty boy. <laughs> Only preemption does that to me now. <laughs> and I have to, sometimes have to say it twice. Uh, she... The, the, the look she threw over her shoulder is with me still. And that was in 1978, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers in Christ, uh, comrades and friends. And nothing that she ever did after that, nor the people to whom she did it, ever surprised me.
Nothing came as a surprise after that. Hitch, so it pays to have sex with the leader of the opposition. Hitch, just another question to plumb your well of knowledge. Um, there's a guy called Henny Youngman who uh, I've always regarded as some sort of role model for you in that he was British and he was a writer and he went over to the States and he, he liked drinking. And there's a line that he came up with which he said, when I read about the evils of drinking, I gave up reading. And I wondered if you could tell me a little more about Henny Youngman and if you had any other great one-liners like that. Was Henny Youngman British? I didn't know that. A, a, amazing number of American comedians do turn out to be British in the, in the first uh, years, as it were. You, I, I have to, I will always I promise an honest answer. If I don't know, I'll tell you. I didn't know that about Henny Youngman. I'm amazed as well. Bob Hope is a Brit. Um, and I actually once saw him do a stand-up act, introducing Prince Philip, which must have been, what a trudge that was, <laughs> in Los Angeles at Mel Griffin's old hotel. Mel Griffin's old hotel. Well, he said, not everyone knows this, but I'm actually English. I was born in Eltham, in Middlesex. He said, I, I didn't leave uh, Eltham, Middlesex, till I was five. And then he said, it was either that or marry the girl. Um, I remember Dean Martin said that he was really sorry for people who didn't drink because when they woke up in the morning, that was the best they were going to feel all day. <laughs> so I'm, yeah, I can feel young man's pain, all right. Tell me, what are you most frightened of? Boredom. Boredom terrifies me. I feel it like a physical sensation, like a choking dream. Or like a smothering dream, as Wilfred Owen says in Dolce and Decorum Masters. As if, if I go on talking to this person or being exposed to this set of circumstances for any longer, I really might die or go mad or bite someone. <laughs> At any moment, it's a, it leads to a fugue state. Uh, to arranging not to be bored is a fantastically large part of my life. Um, uh, fending off bores, finding out where they might be, where they, where they, might, where they might be coming. And you, and you know it's not paranoia because you know that there, are a lot, there really are a lot of them around and that they really do want to come and talk to you. Tedium. Tedium is, tedium is the enemy because um, you'll be dead a very long time, I'm sure of that. And I've seen some dress rehearsals for it take place, and I, as I say, it's a, it's a losing struggle. There isn't a minute to be spent being bored. Anything is better than boredom. Uh, no terror could be worse than boredom. Um, against the bores, always against the bores. No, I'm, I, I am, it's a physical sphere as well as an emotional one. It's a dread, it's a nightmare. It's a, Poltergeist, it's a haunting, it never leaves me. I won't be bored. And then there are the ones who aren't just boring, but they're the cause of boredom in others. The people who spread tedium like a fog. Um, it's full time, if, if, if that's all you did, you'd be busy all day. Mustn't be boring. Don't be boring. Don't put up with a minute on it. Say, I'm really, I'm, some people think it's bad manners, you know, it is bad manners if you've met someone at a party and been introduced, you take your chances with them, you, but you're not supposed to look over your shoulder, their shoulder to see if there's someone more interesting, and it's true, you shouldn't, that's rude. But you can say, I'm, I'm sorry, you're just fantastic, you want <laughs> I don't have any time to give to this. Nothing you could say would ever interest me. <laughs> don't bore somebody else. I'm sorry, I just can't take it for another moment. I can't, I just can't take it. I won't take it, you know. I don't have to take it. I'm going now. Um, I'd like your sort of unedited opinion of uh, certain Peter Hitchens and a uh, t uh, Toby Young. If, um, 
if all your young life, when you're, say, two, uh, you, you think you've got it all figured out, um, you think, I'm going to kill my father really quite soon, and then I'll have mummy all to myself, and she'll do everything I say, not just the things she's already done, but some other things that I haven't asked her to do yet. If that's your plan, as it was mine, <laughs> the last thing you want is a baby brother. So it doesn't really matter which brother it was. It could be a different brother, a nicer brother, a sweeter brother, a more left-wing brother, more right, it couldn't be a more right-wing brother. Um, you just don't want it. Uh, my life, my life was, I can't tell you how awful it was. I had all my ducks in a row, I had all my pieces on the board. I knew mummy was mine. <laughs> she, she had more or less told me so. <laughs> Daddy was kind of, you know, shy. One of those silent, not necessarily strong, but silent. I said, I, I, no, I can, it, I, it gashes me to this day. Don't really know Toby Young or feel about him that strongly. But he better not try and get between me and mummy, is all I'm saying. <laughs> If he knows what's good for me. For Francis, if you had to do a, one of these terrible TV reality programs and you had to invite five people to host the show with you or to have dinner with you, who would you invite and why would you invite them? The ideal dinner party or companionship game, it's like the ideal trying to make up the perfect cricket team or something, is in the end it's going to be self-defeating because, uh, but, uh, but I can't dodge your question, I suppose I would want to have, yeah, it would be all guys, I'm awfully sorry to say. No, see, because for, in the long run, <laughs> The guys don't let you down <laughs> in quite that way. No, I saw it coming. I saw it coming like a bend in the road. I thought I better confess it now rather than have it wrung out of me later. When I think about it, I think about chat. If you ask me which women I would have on the session, I actually I wouldn't tell you, but uh, I break my promise. But if, if it was men, you really want them? Well, why would you expect it to be anyone you knew about? Am I going to just pick celebrities? Is that what you think of me? <laughs> it has to be people you've heard of to please your first for reality TV. I repudiate this question. <laughs> if it was girls, it would... No, 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 I can't. <laughs> they couldn't never be the same. No, it was going to be the same ones. Uh, good evening. Good evening, um, yourself. Do you see yourself in Peter Fallow in Wolf's um, Bonfire of the Fantasies? No. Those who've read Peter, uh, Bonfire of the Fantasies, you've read novels, will know that uh, Peter Fallow is an abject drunk, a sponge, a social toady, a climber, an incompetent journalist who writes about the houses of rich people and the gossip of New York City. If I know it's not me, um, a, a lot of people thought that it might be me because he's in there for a reason. He's in there for a quarrel I have with Anthony Hayden Guest. Um, which I could tell you all about if you liked. But, uh, do you want to hear about all about him? Okay. Um, Anthony Hayden Guest is a brilliant writer in many ways, but he, he is a bit of a Brit, a bit of a piss artist, a bit of a New York socialite, and when I had to write an attacking profile of Tom Wolfe once, which I really wanted to do, I asked Anthony to arrange a meeting between us, and then I did to Tom Wolfe what he does to everyone else. I eavesdropped his conversation, ran to the men's room every now and then to write it down, and wrote a piece showing how shabby his table talk was, exactly what he'd done to Leonard Bernstein and the others. And he was unbelievably uh, slow to see the joke. Um, <laughs> For such a white-coated, straw-hatted, Panama-boated wit, <laughs> fucking stuff. Very slow to see the joke, and I, I'm sad to say, very quick to take it out on poor Anthony, who I hadn't told, I hadn't told Anthony that was my plan at all. But Wolf thought poor Anthony had set it up. So 
it was a bad business and he quarreled with Anthony and cast him out of his circle and then he put in the book a journalist, an English sponge, who's clearly, well, I'll just say, not me. Um, this uh, journalist also, um, no, this would be dirty, this would, this would involve filth. Are you going to demand filth? Yeah. Barracking for filth. Okay. No one ever loses money betting on the lowest common denominator as well. Well, the story about Anthony Hayden Guest is always that he's, he's cursed. Lots of men worry about this. It isn't always discussed in public. Not everyone comes clean about it. But a lot of men worry that their penises are too large. And that... It's an impressive cackle there. And, um... Where was that? Right under the lights I get this sort of eldritch mirth at the idea of a dick that's too big. <laughs> well, they, what they worry about is there won't be enough blood for both of them. Well, there may be some urgent need for transfusion and the, the myth about uh, Anthony was that this was true and that's in the book too. Um, a terrible, a terrible, a really disgraceful, uh, unsuitable for family consumption episode where the naughty girls at the office during the Christmas party peel back the horrible lid of the Xerox machine, peel back the horrible lid of the Xerox machine, and take the helpless, the drunk man to and slap it on Xerox. How low can you go? Anyway, Anthony uh, became very cross with me because he said he blamed me the whole thing and the misrepresentation of him in the book, and he put his hands right around my neck like this on the steps of the New York Public Library after a vogue dinner and said, you've ruined my entire reputation in the town, and you've held me up to mockery and in Wolf's book. And, and it was quite an impressive pressure. I, I, had the I had the time to say, but Anthony, all I've really said about you had is you've got a gigantic cock. <laughs> And his grip palpably relaxed around my head while he thought about that. And I had time to break free. So it goes to show, if you know how to find somebody's G-spot, that's half the battle. I can't believe I told you any of that. But I promised you a truthful plan. If you believe that wow. men... <laughs> Don't make any sudden moves. <laughs> if you believe that men let you down, don't let you down in the long run, what happened with mummy? Mummy? Can you take another run at saying that? I'm sorry. Certainly. If you believe that men don't let you down in the long run, what happened with mummy? Mummy stuck by me to the end. How, and, how is it then... What? How is it then that you believe that only men won't let you down? Where, who, who are you? Where are you? <laughs> I know where you live already. I just don't know who you are. I'm interested. Yes. <laughs> I mean, stuck by me to the end. You'll have to be content with that. And I to her. What did you think of the, uh, the reporter at the New York Times that made up the, the stories? And have you ever made anything up? Of the recent scandal of the New York Times? Um, The editor of the New York Times is a man called Howell Rains, who some of you may have heard of or even seen in action. And he's quite a nice guy, I think. And he's from Alabama, originally. I believe he's from Birmingham, Alabama. That's how they, they pronounce Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama. And about um, five or six years ago, he wrote a story about growing up, a, a story about himself, I mean, it was a, a biographical story, autobiographical story, about growing up in the South 
in the Deep South in the 50s and 60s and how bad he felt at being a white guy in Birmingham, Alabama, and how he learned everything he needed to know about segregation and racial discrimination, racism as a system, from a very nice black nanny that he happened to have. And in a way it was a very affecting story, and in another way I thought it was a very nauseating story, because I, I thought I'd read enough by then about white boys in the South who'd learned all about social reality from their cooks, their maid servants, their footmen, their serfs, um, and other black people who were in a position to give them full information about what was going on. And I actually couldn't believe that someone who was that senior at the New York Times would write such an embarrassing story about himself at that stage and get it published in the Sunday magazine of his own paper. But it came back to me recently because it's very obvious to me uh, that a young jerk called Jason the Blair, who's a fantasy merchant and a crackhead and a coke artist and a uh, fallabout drunk and a plagiarist and a general Walter Mitty figure, um, had been allowed to roam free through the paper, making up anything he liked and getting it printed, and it was because Howell Reigns thought that he was his nanny's son. The worst form of racism, I think, is condescension. Not, no, 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 let's not say the worst. The worst, we know what the worst is like. But a very bad form of it is, is condescension or, or patronizing. Um, if you want to know how to, you want to know how to piss off black people in America? It could come in handy one day. <laughs> you want to know how to piss them off? There are two ways. One is to compare their civil rights struggle to the struggle of homosexuals for equal marriage rights. I don't know why that pisses them off, but it does. <laughs> uh, and the other is to say of any one of them how articulate he or she is. Don't be calling me articulate. You can, you can see the objection right away. Um, I hope. I very much hope you can, Jay Ray. I think Mr. Renz uh, was too clutzy to see um, that, that distinction. So he's made his paper look a fool. And himself. And so when people say, well, would it have happened if he had been white? The answer actually is no. That should be a final condemnation of a certain kind of condescension, I think. Um, I have nothing to drink at the moment, Peter. Is there any remedy for this that you can devise? I mean, I've literally, I've never gone in water. Ah. How, how could you tell? Was I running on empty? My view, my practice, my promise, uh, comrades, is that I, don't, I won't leave when anyone feels they have an unanswered question, but don't try me too high. What time is it for one day? I've got two questions, if possible. Um, the I'll be the judge if they're possible or not. Okay. Um, the first question is, why did you really leave the nation? Um, I've, I'm not convinced by why you wrote in your last column in the, in the nation about the reasons Who is that you can person? tell us about it. Uh, so the second question is about, um, can you tell us a bit more about uh, Martin Amos? Are you still best friends? And in your heart of hearts, do you, who do you think is a smarter one? <laughs> Just do the last five words again. No, the last ten. Okay, uh, the second question then. Um, can you tell us about you and Martin Amos? Yes. Are you still best friends? And in your heart of hearts, who do you think is the smarter one? I left the nation because, I don't know if you know the tone of voice I'm talking about, but someone who says, how, how can you tell? If you hear someone say, Well, Saddam Hussein is a very bad guy, but there are lots of bad guys around the place. You know immediately this person probably doesn't care and certainly doesn't know anything about Iraq or Saddam Hussein. And that they're trying to change the subject. The same person is likely to go on to say, anyway, as between Bush's fundamentalism and Bin Laden's, you know, what's to choose? Uh, we need regime change in Washington. Some glib stupidity of this kind, some pitiful idiocy of this sort. Uh, so now I was saying, called a cabinet meeting where he ordered one half of his cabinet to shoot the other half so that they could all be complicit 
the survivors, those who hadn't been tortured to death or otherwise murdered, would be the murderers. It's a mafia system as well as a national socialist and fascistic one. And I'm saying it's destroyed the, the lives and society and environment of three populations in this country, the, the Kurdish, the Shia and the Marsh Arabs. Um, Saddam Hussein has tortured to death the brother of his own foreign minister, and tortured his other brother, not quite to death, and then sent Naji Sabri, who I used to know, out wearing a five-piece suit to do elegant diplomacy with Count Shirak. That was the guy you saw, that was Naji Hadithi. That's what so that we made him into a zombie by torturing and killing his brothers. Tarek Aziz, the other smoothie, had his son sentenced to 25 years in jail just before the last UN discussions began. Um, this is uh, evil, by the way. There isn't another word for it. President Bush didn't refer to an axis of sin. Don't get me wrong. Uh, if he wanted to win over some liberals, he would have done better to say axis of lesser evil. Then they'd have all run in behind him. Evil is a word not from religion, it's a word from modern political uh, philosophy. It's from, in our usage, it's from Hannah Arendt. Radical evil and the banality of evil come from serious discussions about why it is that Europe became genocidal. People who titter at this, or the use of necessary words, are frivolous and flippant. I can't tell you how through I am with people who talk like that. I can't tell you how through I am with them, how little respect I have for them, how sick I am with their little jingles, their avoidances of reality and responsibility. So it wasn't enough just to piss on them with as much velocity or height as I could muster in print. I had to say, I'm not, I'm not going to work for the magazine that provides these titters to unserious people anymore. They, from now on, they can titter on their own. They can titter without me. Um, it's a kind of a money-mouth relationship, in other words, uh, which everyone has to come to a certain point in their life. It was more than a political disagreement. Um, Martin is uh, able to quote not just poetry, but prose. Uh, I can do a certain amount of poetry and... Um, a sonnet sequence, but Martin can quote paragraphs of prose from Dickens and Nabokov and show a real understanding of them. Um, it's an achievement I've very, very, very rarely seen uh, replicated. And in addition to that, he's the only blonde I've ever really, really loved. Good evening. Um, well, Good evening yourself. Can you tell us what you think the major reasons are for you not being a major politician or a major rock star? <laughs> Again, if I may do it in reverse order. <laughs> well, the rock star is obvious. I couldn't handle any more action than I'm getting as it is. <laughs> it would be surplus to requirements. Okay? <laughs> I just don't need the aggravation of being one. I used to want very much to be, I used to want very much to represent a, a, a constituency in Parliament. I'd at one point given anything to do it, but um, uh, but I was expelled from the Labour Party uh, because of Vietnam, and I decided I was prouder of that than of anything I could have done uh, in the other direction. It's still, to me, a, a moment of, of, of pride that, that Wilson. Labour Party kicked out myself and the rest of the student, uh, then student leadership of the Labour Party, and um, we considered that resignation or expulsion to be final. Um, and still is, I think, the lowest point of um, of the post-war Labour Party. Other, others might nominate other low points, but it won't go any lower than Harold, Harold Wilson licking Lyndon Johnson's bottom. It won't. Uh, so that's why I had to give up that. And then I found, well, I wasn't fit for any other work but journalism. And now you see the harvest, as uh, Jesus used to say. As Bertie used to say, so now I view the harvest. My dear chap, I'm afraid of losing my voice and I need this particular medicine. I'm going to need to rasp a bit. That was a very solemn question, by the way. You flirt with a solemn ending to the evening. 
if you go in like this. Um, Mr. Hitchens, you, you know Larkin very well. Um, and you know that Larkin in Dockery and Sunset, life is first boredom, then fear. So can we have a real answer to the question? Because you're too old to be bored. So what do you really fear? Larkin, that was, it seems to me, this echoing, um, Kierkegaard, it says in life, the, the bloody thing about life is you have to live it forward and only be able to review it backwards. You, know, you can't find out what the mistake is till you've made it. That neither stuck with that. Larkin helps you with stoicism, I think, in, you know, in that reflection. Um, and in many, many other ways, too. Um, and he has one actually fantastic, too. Um, and he has one actually fantastic poem, I can't do it all, about um, tedium. Um, uh, it, it's about it's about a party invitation that he gets and can't bear to open. Or finally goes and says, um, "Alice Morales." No, that's not Alice Morales. No, no, no. That's that's the Chatley but Surely, that sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me. Between the end of the Chatley band and the Beatles' first LP, that's Alice Morales. The one about being bored senseless as soon as you open an envelope and discover an invitation from some bores begins, um, uh, my wife and I have asked a crowd of craps to come and waste their time and hours. Perhaps you care to join us. <laughs> In a pig's ass, friend, says nothing. And the guy turned, it's called Warlock Williams. Which, like, Warlock Williams, yeah, Warlock Williams, he says nothing. Um, I could say, I could spend every evening if I wanted, count it over to catch the drivel of some bitch who's only read which. You can tell how really, he really, really hated being born, even for a second. I love him for that, and for his atheism, and for his um, making himself impossible for Thatcher to nominate as poet laureate once she found out about uh, this be the verse. True, well, he was afraid that Bors would win in the end because it was a choice between them and solitude. Uh, the same way as he thinks about when he's in church going. He thinks, well, this is all nonsense, but as long as you don't believe a word of it, you can spend a tranquil moment in a church. But as, you, as the first line says, once I'm sure there's nothing going on. <laughs> and everyone knows this be the verse, I presume. Well, that's why Thatcher wouldn't nominate him. So. Good evening. Um, I'd Good evening like to explain your views on the royal family. Do, do you think the fact that we still live in a monarchy says something about, about the British public, or you know, does, it, does it say something about the attributes of the royal family? <laughs> uh, Thomas Paine, who was, I think, the greatest Englishman and the greatest American, and is the first man to use the expression, the United States of America, I think, I'm pretty sure, and is the moral author of the Declaration of Independence, and the man who organized the ruin of the Hanoverian riffraff in um, North America. Uh, said, uh, as well as having written The Age of Reason and the Rights of Man, and showing that, that you can't have one without the other, that the two concepts are the same. The Age of Reason, the Rights of Man. You invents human rights. I know where you live too. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, he said that a hereditary uh, government is as, as good as a hereditary poet, or hereditary mathematician. Um, and it's not as good, because I think some mathematical talent can be inherited. I don't think much political talent can be, but it's, it's as absurd as that. So people who want to be governed by it are so well. My quarrel with monarchism is obviously for its absurdity for, and stupidity, the idea that, that, the, that it's designed by the blood. Breeding a ruling family and selecting it is, is as nasty in its implications as breeding a master race. Eugenics won't do for politics. You can't do it. They say, well, 
uh, of the wretched Spencer girl. They said, well, at least she had an air and a hair before she was cut down. Well, how nasty is that? It's like reading about some ghastly animal experiment. No, people who want to be ruled in this way, the quarrel therefore is with monarchical opinion. These people are servile. They want to be impressed in this way. That's the kind of thing they like. The quarrel is with public opinion. Um, I mean, if what's more, what's more horrible to see some some mediocre imposter ride by in a golden coach, or to see people you know flinging themselves onto the pavement to get a glimpse of it and, and tell all their children about it and say, you know. You won't believe the excitement I have today. The human race is damned when people are willing to worship. The, the, the willingness to worship is, the, is, is our problem. It's like North Korea. You get every chance to praise the leader all the time and thank him for your, for your benisons and for being the fount of all good things. You're a serf if you think like that. So the real thing is to cure British people of servility. Otherwise you can take the monarchy away and they bring it back. My dear. Uh, thanks for a very entertaining talk, by the way. Uh, if, the, uh, You're two, welcome. if the 2004 election came between uh, Bush and John Kerry, who would you rather see win? Uh, I would be for the re election of the president at the moment. I don't like the look of Mr. Kerry. Um, I'll give you one reason why. Um, he's not a bad guy, by the way, I think it's very improbable the Democrats, having not carried one single southern state last time, are likely to elect another uh, northeastern Massachusetts politician. I think they'd be very ill advised to do so. But if they do, one reason will be that their man is a war hero. And I don't think there were any war heroes in the Vietnam War, and I don't admire people who went and volunteered for it as John Kerry did, especially those who took a video camera along with them to record their exploits in the Mekong Delta for later political videos. I'm sorry, I don't think Vietnam should have been used in that way by ambitious young cadets. And I'm mentioning it because a lot of people falsely say that you're, that you're in a better position to advocate uh, a policy of force, for example in foreign policy, if you have yourself been a soldier or a combatant. The implication, the direct implication being you're in a weaker position if you have not. The people who haven't been in combat ought not to be pronouncing on war, where, where soldiers will be sent. This is an incredibly dangerous point of view. It would mean that Abraham Lincoln, who'd never been in the army, could not have fired General McClellan, who was a segregationist general who was holding up the action in the fight against the Confederacy. What right does Lincoln have to dismiss a brave soldier? What does he know about war? It would have meant Truman couldn't have dismissed the megalomaniac uh, Douglas MacArthur as chairman of the Joint Chiefs because he wanted to run a private war in Korea and China. It's very essential to have civilian control. And if, if uh, the Democrats nominate Kerry, you can, you, I, know, I can tell you now what will happen. All the supposedly anti-war liberals will be saying it's better to have someone who was part of a criminal war in Vietnam than someone who dodged the job. And that will be a test of how utterly insincere and shallow and vapid anti-war opinion is in the United States and elsewhere. Um, you, you've done a lot of work on, on gay rights and a lot of your heroes are gay. I have not. You have? You've, you've, what is this? You've written, you've written about it, haven't you? Bit of no, we're in touch with a barge pole. You have. <laughs> I was going to ask if you ever no, seen you a have to be confused with a whole other person. No, <laughs> I've read your stuff. You, you, you like right. a lot of your. No, all right, I've written about gay men. <laughs> a lot of your, a lot of your heroes. He's a lumberjack. Yeah. He's okay. <laughs> have, have you, have you ever been tempted by homosexuality yourself? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> well, I've been more than more than tempted. <laughs> Oh, you have to explain that. Well, look, if you, if you say you've only been tempted, it means you violate the rule of try at least everything once. <laughs> to say you've only been tempted would be an empty statement. You have to, you have, to have some follow-through if you say you've been tempted. You have to say, okay, what, tempted enough to find out what it was like? Yeah, that tempted. <laughs> See? 
But you see, there's all the difference in the world. The girls offered to buy me one. <laughs> and you wonder why I gave it up. I frankly wouldn't trust a chap who hadn't, who hadn't tried, uh, hadn't shopped on that side of the street. And it has to be avowed, it should be avowed, um, that homosexuality is a form of love as well as a form of sex, and deserves respect and, in my case, nostalgia for that reason. <laughs> Why do you laugh at that? That's not supposed to be funny. That's supposed to be touching. It was touch. Cheap mirth with that virus. No, you may not believe it now, but I mean, there was a time when I was rather more presentable when, you know, I had to bend them off. Some of them. Others. That was never fine. Okay. How are we doing? That was a near one, I was saying. How are you, man? Uh, other than alcohol and uh, tobacco, have you ever experimented with any other substances? Try anything once, except the incest and Scottish dancing. <laughs> would be the would be roughly it. Um, I have I did not ever have anything to do with. Um, the so-called mind-expanding lysergic acid uh, preparations that were freely available when I was a teenager in the 60s. I thought anyone who messes with that is a fool, or is going to become one if they weren't one before, and I know some of the very damaged survivors of that to this day. I never went anywhere near that. So I can't, I can't really say the truth of the rule, but um, yeah, I mean, try and learn anything else, I, I could give you a rough read on it. Um, the, most of them uh, end up, well, of course, everything, as Martin says in, uh, in Money, um, when he offers, uh, John Self offers uh, the other character of Munch, he offers him a sip of this poisonous, bubbling carafe of red wine. The guy says, No, no, I won't do it. Um, if I drink, uh, I feel like shit after, after lunch, I feel like shit in the afternoon. And Martin says, Yeah, but if you don't have a drink, you feel like shit all lunchtime. Um, life's like that, he goes on to say. You want to feel good in the morning or good in the evening? You, know, you want to feel good when you're young or good when you're old? Uh, so it's all a trade-off, but with, for example, cocaine, it seems to me you have to choose between that and sex. In the end. People can't, in the end, do both. Uh, that gives a lot of people pause. Um, so, be, you know, be... Be exorbitant but discriminating would be, would be my mind. And as ever, thanks for asking. That sounded like the Citibank billboards. That sounded like? The Citibank billboards. Still didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> the Citibank billboards in New York that tell you to live richly but, you know, be careful. Live richly, die poorly. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get it. Um, uh, well, I have a quick question. Do you vote in the U.S.? I think it exceeds like extent. No, I don't. Um, don't. I have um, a, a platform. I have a, a way of imposing. I, I can say what I like. People have to put up with it. So I, I, it's much better than much better than voting. They raised the, they lowered the voting age to 18 when I was 19. So I, I, I still had to wait till I was 21 to vote. It was a cruel trick that was played on our generation by Richard Nixon and others, and um, I don't think I've actually voted for anyone else since, but I've shouted yells about it. Uh, would you like a clean one or a filthy one? You see, it's so easy, it's just in. Um, I was the amount of devices. I was thinking locally. I'm acting globally, but I'm thinking locally. <laughs> and devices, um, whose balls were of two different sizes. The left one was small, no good at all, but the right one was big, won prizes. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
was the young lady of Exeter, so pretty the chaps craned their necks at her, and one was so brave as to take out and wave the distinguishing mark of the sex at her. Was young fellow named Rex with They raised the they lowered the voting age to eighteen when I was nineteen. So I, I, I still had to wait till I was twenty one to vote. It was a cruel trick that was played on our generation, which is by Richard Nixon and others, and um, I don't think I've actually voted for anyone else since, but I've shouted yells about it. Would you like a clean one or a filthy one? Yeah. You see, it's so easy, it's just easy. <laughs> um, there was a young man from Devizes. I was thinking locally. I'm acting globally, but I'm thinking locally. <laughs> from Devizes, um, whose balls were of two different sizes. The left one was small, no good at all, but the right one was big, won prizes. Um, <laughs> Was the young lady of Exeter so pretty the chaps craned their necks at her, and one was so brave as to take out and wave the distinguishing mark of the sex at her? Was the young fellow named Rex with exceeding small organs of sex, so when charged with exposure, he, re he replied with composure, De minimis non curat lex. Are you challenging me? Well, Penzance? No, come on. Nantucket? Anthony Pohl succeeds in, in making a lot of very improbable names seem plausible for his characters in the Dance of the Music of Time, which I hope you've all read or 12 volumes of. Because if you give someone a place name as a name, however ludicrous it appears, it's somehow convincing, as would, say, Widdenpool, which is in, I believe, Leicestershire. Um, and place names are very important for limericks, and that's why it's a great English form, because there's so many wonderful place names to fit that. Um, there's some quite good ones in New England, too, as with the young man from Nantucket, whose thing was so long he could suck it. <laughs> Who remarked with a grin as he wiped off his chin, if my ear was a pussy, I'd fuck it. <laughs> Par exemple, I mean, the, or, um, the young girl from Penzance, a poor girl from Penzance, actually, who boarded a bus in a trance, so the passengers fucked her. Likewise, the conductor, poor driver, shot off in his pants. <laughs> it's, isn't it amazing how you, they, they always go for the smart, the filth. You never lose money by underestimating them. Contributing editor with Vanity Fair magazine, where he writes a monthly column. He breaks his own fan club. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's Sid Blumenthal over there. Anyway, he also writes a column for the Nation. Christopher has worked in many publications in London and U.S., including the Daily Express, Harper's, The Spectator, and the Times Literary Supplement. He was a book critic at New York Newsday. He has written several books, including one on Mother Teresa called The Missionary Position. And he has written and presented a number of documentaries for British television. I'm not making that up. It says that right here. <laughs> Welcome, our friend from Britain, Christopher Hitchens. Just the live one. It's kind of, my theme is, um, my theme is sadness and melancholy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it, is, it is sort of sad, isn't it, that there are so many of you with nothing better to do on a fine evening <laughs> like this. Um, don't think I'm not going to do some of these things. Um, earth tones. <laughs> Shouldn't you already know when you're in the toilet? <laughs> do you remember when... Um, you remember when Bob Strauss uh, had a list of things to do in Washington, how to live, how to be, what things cost. Uh, he said, if you want a friend, get a dog. Now it's, if you want a friend, hire a wolf. Does, does that compute? 
I don't go for political jokes very much, and as I say, I'm, I'm having a fit of the, of the blues, but it did occur to me while I was waiting up there that what Warren Beatty has already done to American womanhood is what Mr. Clinton has only succeeded in doing to the country. How, how many times, everyone talks about him as if he was sexy, I can't personally stand that. How many times before have you heard a man say, no, it wasn't sex because uh, she didn't feel a thing? <laughs> And I can prove it. Um, I thought the real problem with Washington, because if you laugh at a lot of these jokes, you know, it's like Mark Russell with the elephants and the donkeys, or considering Herblock a cartoonist, it's too, it's too sad making. Have a little ditty about loneliness and what it's like to be ostracized and upset and unwanted and it goes like this it was early last september as near as i remember i was falling down the street in drunken pride where i fell into the gutter thinking thoughts i dare not utter and a pig came up and lay down by me side as i lay there in that gutter thinking thoughts i dare not utter a fair young maid came by and she did say You can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses And at that the pig got up and walked away <laughs> And the pig got up, slowly walked away Because what I think you see, you may be thankful You're very good, you're very kind, you're most kind, you're most kind because what I think, and I may be in the right melancholy frame of my is the problem with Washington is solitary vice. Solitary vice, the sin of own man, and the unwillingness of people to admit to it. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the vice both obscene and unsavory holds the Bishop of London in slavery, with lascivious howls, he deflowers young owls, the lures to an underground aviary, that kind of sin. I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking of the sort of more cheerful kind, you know, where the pilot, this is about a Delta male, by the way. Um, the pilot, the pilot, uh, it's an easy takeoff, he slumps back, throws the, tells the passengers the usual stuff, then uh, throws the microphone back onto the, hangs it up, and says to his co-pilot, jeez, well, that's over, all I need now is a cup of coffee and a blowjob. But he hasn't hung it up right, and it echoes down the cabin. So one of the stewardesses, do you see that Senator Kennedy, by the way, on the stewardship um, act of the prevention treaty referred to as the Stewardess Act three times before it was taken out of the congressional record? That's actually true. So the stewardess, hearing this and panicking from the back, runs up the aisle to tell them what's happening in the cockpit and alert them. And as she runs up the aisle, someone shouts rather heartlessly, hey lady, don't forget the coffee. I just sit alone. I just sit alone, making making pathetic word games for myself. I look out of the window. I look down again at the console. I just do sad, lonely word games, trivial, pathetic, really. Um, the one I'm working on now is one where just take any well-known phrase or saying which has the word heart in it, replace it with the word dick. It cheers me up sometimes. For example. Bury my, bury my dick at wounded knee. I left my dick in San Francisco. Dick break hotel. The dick is a lonely hunter. The dick has its reasons. It, it, it can really, you know, a whole day. Uh, and so, but wait, I tell you what the payoff is. The payoff is that every time you hear someone refer to the heartland, a sort of wintry smile can creep across your face. I'm going back to the, I'm going back to the heartland. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Now, it's my view, and I, I think my time is upon me. And anyway, it's best to cut these things short and, and, and go back and. I'll be alone again. It's been very nice of you to come.
My view has always been that the, the old jokes are the best, but the long jokes are the best of all. I'm thinking of the loneliest guy I could think of, the most sad, dejected, miserable, empty figure of all, uh, Richard Nixon. I actually thought of a story that's true, that I thought I'd sh share with you. Um, it seems that when you went to China, it, the thing had to be scrambled in rather a hurry. It, you probably remember this. It had to be kept a bit secret. He asked his advisors, what, what are we going to get when we get there? What's going to happen? They said, well, we don't think you're going to meet Mao Zedong right away, um, Mr. President. Probably a dinner in the Great Hall of the People, and probably with Zhou Enlai. And he said, okay, what, what, do I, what should I know about this Zhou Enlai? <clears throat> they said, well, Mr. President, he's very interested in history from a Marxist point of view. I know that, said Nixon. And very interested in the ironies of history. So Nixon says, that's what you got for me? History from a Marxist point of view with ironies. And they said, that's it, Mr. President. <laughs> so it gets in. It's true. It is the Great Hall of the People. It's a banquet. Zhou Enlai is sitting opposite him, looking. You may remember Zhou Enlai, very impassive, very beautiful, very Mandarin like. Nixon's task is to make conversation. It says, History is a hell of a thing, isn't it, Mr. General Secretary? Zhou Enlai agrees, nods. Full of ironies, says Nixon. Skipping the Marxist bit of it. Joan Lyce says, yeah, I think so. For example, said Nixon, I once ran against a guy called John Kennedy for president. Yeah, we, we saw that, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and he beat me. Yeah, we saw, we got that here too. And then, by now, the perspiration is dripping from Nixon's features. He thinks he's dying there. He thinks, uh, well, he said, look, um, then, then not long after the man who beat me was killed, like, slave, cut down by an assassin's bullet. Joan Lyce said, yeah, we saw that too. Nixon is drowning by now. He said, but, but now suppose, Mr. General Secretary says, suppose that instead of that bullet, that ironically, that bullet had gone instead through your great antagonist, the man who you were quarreling with, Mr. Nikita Khrushchev, think our history would have been different then. Joe Lai perks up and says, oh, actually, I can think of something that would have been really different. And Nixon thinks, bingo. At last, he says, sobbing with gratitude, says, uh, well, what would that have been? Journalize says, well, I don't think Aristotle and Narcissus would have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> well, it all happened, and you, you've been very, very nice to me indeed, and it's, it's great, and, and what an audience, and thank you very much. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens. I didn't see what's so funny. I don't find it amusing at all. There's this uh, mullah and um, a rabbi and a priest. <laughs> and, and they walk into a bar together in New York and the, and the barman says, what is this, some kind of joke? <laughs> they say that uh, brevity is the, the soul of wit. I think I just disproved that. I think jokes should be long, don't you? I don't think they can easily be political. Politics isn't very funny. I don't find it amusing any longer. I think what one needs is actually not better politicians, but a better electorate and some better journalists. Well, you, you guys just laughed at donkey and elephant jokes. Jesus. And the people who brought cue cards. The last time I did this was at the improv and I was beaten by Joe Lieberman with cue cards. How funny was that? <laughs> it's like, um, it's like a Larry King interview. He, you know the questions are going to be tough. He says, so, you got all the money in the world, you have the supermodel on your arm, Give the book contract, the MacArthur Genius Award. What the fuck is that? <laughs> what the hell is that about? Then you know you have a tough question from a member of the press. And people don't even listen to the answers. You know, um, people don't hear what they're saying. Jimmy Hoffa Jr., when he first ran for president of the Teamsters Union, they said, 
What's your ambition? He said, I want to follow in my father's footsteps. <laughs> but no, I didn't say it. There was no supplementary question, no follow-up. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to have to do to, you know, beguile the weary hour is, um, I've no intention of being brief, by the way, the brevity of it, so I think, um, I think all filth is local. And that a joke isn't a joke unless it's at somebody's expense. Um, so there's this guy fighting traffic driving home in, in Los Angeles. Really tough on the freeway. And he knows he's going to be late home, so he picks up his car phone and punches in the number. And the voice answers, See? He says, Teresa, see? Send him. Uh, just tell the missus, would you wake her up? Uh, I've got something to tell her. Um, she leaves the phone, comes back. Says, Mises in the in bedroom, Senor. Well, well, wait up, I've got to talk to her. No, Mises in, in bedroom with otro other, other hombre. <laughs> okay, she's still fighting this fucking traffic. Says, okay, where are you? In the den? She says, see? Uh, look at my desk. Pull open the left hand drawer. Can pull it open? See? Is there, is there a gun there? See? <laughs> okay, take the gun, go upstairs, <clears throat> shoot her. <laughs> Shoot him, get on the extension. Long fighting the traffic, juggling the whole thing, and uh, finally the extension's picked up. He says, Teresa, if you see, have you killed them? See? Okay, now watch, open the window and throw both of the bodies out into the swimming pool. No swimming pool here, so you. Is this 3102? Now, that you'll notice is a clean joke. If a joke can't be short, if it can't be long, if it can't be clean, it should have a, it's someone's expense. It's like limericks. Um, most people think limericks are going to be filthy. That can be where they make their big mistake. There was a young engine driver named Hunt. He was given an engine to shunt. Saw a runaway truck. By yelling out, duck, saved the life of the fellow in front. You see, you're all, that's what you want, isn't it? You wanted that to be, you wanted that to be filthier. Well then, uh, there are these two onions. Male onion, female onion. Rolling along together, pop, bang into each other. Instant rapport. A torrential affair begins, they can't get enough of each other. Pretty soon, an onion bonding has occurred. Not long enough, you think, to, make, to tie the knot. Get together, make it legal. And the union is blessed, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, and a little baby onion, a tiny little cocktail onion is born. <laughs> and um, this means, of course, that the father onion has to put in more time at the shipyard, extra shifts, you know what it's like. Mother onion, much encumbered with other work around the place, and this and that, and the baby onion isn't as well, well supervised as he might have been, and uh, as baby onion's well, the door being left open one day, rolls out, across the sidewalk, right into the path of a sodding grade lorry, flattened out, rushed to hospital, a team of surgeons fights all night to save his life. Mother Onion, out of it, heavily sedated. No more, can't, just can't, you know, can't, can't take it, gone. And Father Onion rolling up and down the corridor outside. The emergency room goes like this, wearing a little groove in the ghastly hospital carpet. Towards dawn, the flat doors open and the surgeon comes out pulling the mask from his head and dashing the perspiration from his eyes and says uh, to the father onion who rolls up anxiously and says well what tell me is he will he is he what the nurse he'll live but i'm afraid he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life <laughs> neither clean <clears throat> neither completely clean nor filthy nor you'll be noticing i hope uh, nor short nor brief no cue cuts or nothing. 
Um, just a second here. Um, do you wouldn't believe how dry it is backstage. <laughs> so, I have to leave you with this, because you have been a really great audience, I must uh, Even though you will laugh at everything. Um, this is the longest joke I know, and I'm giving it to you. It's a kind of a free gift. Anyone who remembers this joke will know how to tell it at any length from now on. You can build in new wings to it and new extensions to it. Uh, if you want, um, I'll give you the condensed version. Picture, if you will, um, the romance that kindles between a young man and a young woman. Her eyes first caught by his extraordinary courtesy. He will always take her coat. He will always open the door. He is always unfailingly polite. He is a man of extraordinary consideration. He finally talks her into the sack. Um, <laughs> You can build in the extensions later, you know? <laughs> So extraordinary is the convulsion of pleasure to which he brings her. And the attention that he pays in order to bring this off, if you will, that she lies hardly daring to speak and says, I've, I never knew that it could be this way with a man and a woman. I just wish, I just wish there was something I could do to please you as you please me. He says, well, as a matter of fact, there is something you could do if you kept it. And she said, well, just name it. And he said, so I kind of wish you'd give me a blowjob. And she says, no, no, I wish you'd said anything but that. Something tells me that if I do that, it won't be the same between us. You won't respect me. You won't admire me, esteem me, revere me in the same way. You won't defer to me. So he, he's a gentleman. He takes it very well. This is the first day. It goes on like that. It goes on like that for something like, for a year or so. And it's always the same. You can, you can do your own. Every time she says, I can't tell you. And if only, and he says, well, actually, since you mentioned it. And uh, no, but she says, you won't. You just, I know it won't be the same. It won't be the same. They get married. The honeymoon night is a torrential tribute by him to her of every conceivable attention. Um, and, but in the meantime, always the door held open, always the taxi door held open, always the coat taken, always the deference, the tenderness. But even on a honeymoon night, she won't, she does learn because respect is a big thing. Um, the 10th anniversary comes. <laughs> See how I'm leaving you the, 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 the room now. The silver wedding. I think we're talking about the pearl anniversary it takes her to Cancun or Cayman Islands, you know, somewhere beautiful, the finest suite, the limo, the thoughtful, well-chosen gifts, the door held open, the attention, the courtesy, and the um, unfailing uh, uh, pleasuring. And finally, she lies back and she, th and she says, again, in a, in a dream of bliss, you've given me all these decades of love and care and tenderness and sex. And I just wish, if only I could, requite this in some way. And he says, well, you know what? I know I've mentioned this before, but if you could just see your way to, and she thinks really, you know, why not? What can it hurt? Um, so in what is still an almost maidenly manner, she falls too. She does her best, and it's pretty good. <laughs> and then it's over, and she thinks, "No, oh, that was wonderful. I, I should have learned to please him like this before, um, and I should never have worried about his attentions, his courtesy, his deference." They're lying there, unable to speak, in this, this dream of mutual assurance, and the phone rings. And it rings and rings and rings and keeps on ringing in their suite, and he says, "Aren't you going to get the phone, cocksucker?" <laughs> well, it's been real, and, and you've been very patient, and I salute you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> One and your dirtiest
Limerick to conclude, if possible? They tend to be clerical, um, the really dirty ones. Uh, was a young fellow of kings whose mind was upon higher things, but his real desire was a boy in the choir with an ounce like a jelly on springs. <laughs> That's not very dirty though, it's usually an idea, it's a curtain raiser for the anti-clerical. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Bishop of Central Japan used to Roger himself with a fan. And when taxed with these acts, he replied, it contracts and expands, rather more than a man. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, you can do it with almost no dirty words. That's the key thing, I think, is to keep it, keep it filthy, but not smutty. Um, a vice both obscene and unsavory holds the Bishop of Barking in slavery with the civics howls, he deflowers young owls, but he lures to an underground aviary. <laughs> um, well, and, okay, you want one dirty one then. Because these are suggestive, shall we say. Mm. Not, not, um, it's, it is said of the Bishop of Birmingham that he fucks little boys while confirming them. They kneel on the hassock, he lifts up his cassock, and, Pumps his Episcopal spoon. <laughs> That's quite dirty. And uh, on that note, uh, but very contemporary, the day, very the day. As the as the um, as the new Elton John song put it, that can now go down the sun, go down the rain. <laughs>
I have some transparent food with gummies, Dharma gummies on it. So the colors should stick. Uh, but I also can't start to um, wet with oil because then it will crack up later. So the medium is 70%. Turpentine, no, turpentine, turp, as it's called, and as usual, I just start with uh, the point of light in the front, the forehead, and then just give it a little bit more volley, a little bit more punch, uh, and there's a lot of blue, a lot of cap luck in the blue, very a lot of nuances, a lot of different hues of blue, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful photo I'm painting from. I'm actually gonna paint a huge one of the same girl and and the kids called the art of painting because it's so it's so beautiful that I want to pour all my skill into it like uh, Vermeer did with his painting called the art of painting and that painting is gonna be a part of a exhibition I will have next year actually called the art of painting and after that, I think most of my exhibitions will actually be called The Art of Painting. One to uh, how many I can manage to do in my lifetime, which is getting shorter every day, <laughs> sadly. Um, Okay. Um, just trying to figure out where the eyes are, where to put the color. I'm going to keep this subtle, very subtle, because it is subtle. It is, the nuances are really subtle. Reminds me of um, some of Valmier's paintings where they almost feel like aquarel or watercolor paintings. And you see how he has let the paint just slide into each other without creating any lines at all. So beautiful. Actually, gives me a bang in a way to watch them in. Actually, in New York, that's where I usually see them. But I guess I should go to other countries as well. And I haven't seen the art of painting live. Actually, I've just seen some of us of the best ones. So I should get a chance to do that, maybe this year, hopefully. And I haven't seen The Night Watch yet by Rembrandt, which also is one of my absolute favorite paintings. So if I can have The Night Watch, the best of Rembrandt and Vermeer, as my and Leonardo da Vinci, the way his concept of being a, being a scientist and having a scientific approach to stuff, then I'm good if I can have those as my objective uh, measure tools. 
for my own work, I can be pretty sure that I will never succeed, but I will keep on trying, keep on understanding, keep on working, and I believe that is the recipe for a thoughtful and beautiful life. Such a funny face on that girl. She has actually been grown up now. Uh, it's, kids grow fast. So, it would be nice to take some new pictures of them and paint them now actually because. Uh, lively kids. They have a beautiful mother, so a beautiful personality, so I guess they will grow up to become quite nice. So this one there's a shadow going up here, and the hair goes in there. It's funny how happy I can become by doing this. It's just so gratifying. And the more you fall in love with it, the better it is. So. Well, I will film a little bit more later and I'm going to try to make this video not too long because my videos tend to grow out of their own good skin and become unbelievably long. I won't be making too filed videos anymore. I will so they will be quite long because there is a lot to talk about and a lot of things to actually repeat. And you might say, oh, you're repeating yourself. Well, yeah, I do. I do repeat myself. But so does everybody else. I mean, <laughs> life is a series of repetitions. The thing is that it's like a painting. You won't be able to repeat exactly stuff exactly as you did the last time. So you can can get deeper. You can even be more superficial. But you will all, always say it in a different way, or more thoughtful way. And I noticed something when I I started talking more in my videos. Of course, the views fell. <laughs> But um, I became more conscious of my own painting process. And I feel that is a good thing. Yeah. Maybe I will start posting short videos with links to the big ones on. I have actually two, two um, channels, or maybe I won't, uh, I'm not sure. So, anyway, it's so sweet. <laughs> Just laugh, the expression of this girl is just amazing. That makes it so interesting. Okay. Well, I will paint and talk more later. 
maybe I should just focus on quality brain. the same technique as you would use if you use charcoal thinking the same way I also have to after a while get these things to melt into each other all the nuances and colors like when I did this I, there's a shadow here then I kind of just grab it and I let it become a part of, of the other color. So there won't be any concrete lines in the end, just a fluid mass of light and color. to get right and it's not done in one go that is for sure I have to go over it many times so it's gonna be fun <clears throat> you can also use my finger to flatten it out a little bit place it and kind of get the she has this funny smile on her face which I will try to get into it See, first I go in with the shadow, then I just try to find the right color and get rid of the thing to make it feel drawn. And again. Depends because here is too light now, and I have to get that down. And there's a light coming down there on the side. This is only the second layer of color. Uh, so I see some big changes but the more 
the font changes comes later when I can work on top of this again and build on it. Most important thing now is get it quite right, fairly right. The news from this to this is very important. And it's also very difficult because it is unbelievably the news is just almost impossible to see. It has to be the right light, amount of light and the right color and yeah so many things to think about but then again there's a little bit of reddish inside there that was too light and that will explain some of the shape of it Yeah, after a while. <clears throat> now, kid's face is very round, sweet, so you also see that in an animal, other, among other animals. I wouldn't call the among animals because we are actually animals, but you see the same features in baby dogs and baby wolves and baby chickens for that matter that they have this sweetness and I guess there is a sort of genetic protection the sweeter you look the more You are protected. If a puppy looked aggressive, it would get killed by the grown ups. So, the longer it can actually look like a puppy, it won't be perceived like a threat. And I guess that is that's the reason for that. thick with the color here so it creates that sculpture sculpture effect um, actually it is uh, like a relief when I do that just put it into the background like this and you just push the shape And it's, of course, nice to get it right. So, you see that effect is very important.
In Rembrandt's painting, some of them, this effect is used to the extreme. And that is why my hypothesis is that he was more in love with the paint than the motifs. And that he enjoyed pushing the limits. You see, I'm starting to build lights and there are also highlights in here. That one I will also keep making better and better as I will go along. Um, Just put on some color and I can work within it later. kind of bluish over here in reality the highlights but I can put, when I make this dry I start with having on the bluish lazure which is then falling into the cracks in the paint and then I start working on top of that so we're starting to get that dynamic effect People ask me, how do you paint skin color? <sighs> no such thing. In this one, the skin color is bluish and reddish. It just depends if you paint, even if you paint from a model, if you paint outdoors, it will be a different color than inside. Because there's a big difference in light inside and light outside, colors in the lights. That is why it's different. Yeah, see now? And then, to make it natural, It's just the beginning. So. Yeah, later. So still working on.
on this figure. Um, so a lot of detail, a lot of moving around, and um, suddenly you realize that these things are wrong, and that the way the stomach is is wrong. That has to go a little bit more down here. Then <clears throat> Good thing is that you can actually take it, take the mirror, take this, and uh, I compare, and then you see basically where you have gone wrong. And well, it's not really that obvious. But yeah, okay. <clears throat> I just have to mark it up a little bit. It's supposed to be. So I go down here. This one goes a little bit further in. Then I cover down here. And Approximately there. This one goes further down. This one is supposed to be in here. <clears throat> it is actually quite exhausting work when you are starting to see your mistakes and you have to start correcting stuff. And that's also why it's so important to keep the brain healthy, to eat good food. Exercise your brain with exercise or something else, chest maybe. So it comes in there. Here, comes up here, it's the arm, it goes in here, down, see how I have the reference point, I could actually have it over there, it would be, when I work with the whole thing I do that, but for, since I'm not using or cheating by using a, a projector, I need to do this by freehand. And that is much more difficult. Actually, it is infinitely much more difficult. Maybe a stretch. So this comes down here, here. And there come folds in the clothes and it goes in here. You have a um, no some goes down there, follows her shape and then comes down in here. And <clears throat> that to... There's a 
more light behind it, but this is the, behind here, the nice and the green, because it's red here, nice and the green, back there, green and blue, oh, fuck. green and blue, so you get that complementary contrast, it's very helpful. You get this in, slender, more slender arm. The funny thing about the child is that they are so... The proportions are so wrong compared to how they are when you're grown-ups. So, you can't really go for the... Well, you can actually study children. And uh, their anatomy, but... I trust they will be able to... Just paint what I see and, and do it by one free hand. This oh this is wrong. It's terrible. The hand has to be over there. So come down here. Of course if I did this one more Took it more slowly when I sketch. I didn't have to do this now. Then again, I would lose the overpaint and the struggle. And that's why I kind of prefer to have that struggle instead. Palette is getting dirty, and that really doesn't make it any more any easier. It's like just another hue, uh, another blue, another hue, a little bit darker maybe, so tone it down a little bit, and there's some shadows here, and I thought I was going to get a little more this painting today but usually it takes more time than I think and I guess that is exactly what happened today but then again I think I got it quite right the face is Absolutely not finished yet, but it's come to a point where I can go into deep detail and yeah, make it better. A lot of things in the room that I will explain that is all behind her. So that is also um, some more white. Um, from where that light comes from probably from the arm there's some perfection there from some of this in here and you have the 
line. Just line it now and I just dissolve it a little bit more later like this and it has highlights the crap luck the crap luck or alzarine as it's called is a really lovely kind of red with a lot of bluish in it and it can be used to so many different things toning and down the blue and you can use it as a shadow or reflection it's because it's kind of broken it's in the violet in a way and it gives a lot of it can, it's a, it's a, it's a it's not neutral, it's a wrong thing to say, but you see here now, I just take that and I put this on and it kind of, it's a warm colour and it, in all this coldness, it warms things up. I find that to be nice. Yes. So it's not. This painting is very much in the blue and the reds and the greens. It's not so much earthy colors around here, maybe, but. Funny, my mom, my mother, oh, mother, doesn't like that I use so much blue. She likes the more earthy colors, but I find them to be, if you use too much brown and black, you know, all these dark colors without any clean colors in them, I, th I feel it becomes so become so dead or mushy or yeah so I prefer the colors are uh, brighter and keeps more lights and yeah there's also a line here with light Which is extremely important, but I can actually just touch this now because it goes down like this. It's a reflection from. I think that light is coming up there and you know, it hits her back and here and then here. So the beauty is that same light it's also hitting here so you get this beautiful shape here and there's a spot and also with a cup luck and this boom a good start. Yeah. Then I'm going to try to get that hand. Do some greenish and blue.
comes in here with the phone down there. Yes, and there are shadows. And So so. To paint the hands, I need to focus on the hands for a few hours when they are dried. But. Just gonna get it in there, approximately where it's supposed to be. Yeah, and like this. Okay. That's better. Yes, it is. This hand is very much in the. Haiti, as she's called. Her name is Haiti. First I put in the shadows, then I make a push it even further down. And down here it is it has this reddish tone in it because it reflects the light from the from here into her stomach. So it becomes a reddish line in a way there also behind here but I have to differentiate a little bit from the background ah, like this so I know where it is no not like that uh, down here In your palette, because it's getting dirty. I 
just do this first, turn it down. And then I kind of pick it up again. Now, what we want to do is use the background as a line. Then I take the greenish, I enhance it a little bit, and I go in and I'm going to drag like this. So I mark where it is now. This is now a little bit lighter than this side, so I just have to keep doing this so it sticks together. And then I will put in shadows that goes down like this. Here and different places, so in the end it becomes what it's supposed to be. Yeah, so hope that helped. Just gonna keep on working. So today it is this one, and it will be a little bit nerve breaking because I really like this sketch and it's almost sad to ruin it but I have to kill it to kind of go beyond a certain point. So I just start with uh, Lazur which I usually do just a little bit of uh, ultramarine, blue, and traplac or alsorine, as it's called. And I have to do like this to shake it up a little bit to get some, um, yeah, it becomes a little bit more dynamic. And I really don't, I usually don't put much in, uh, I really, usually don't put much. Uh, um, oil into the colors when I paint so, so um, forget I put a stroke of white on this yesterday um, but I do better to do it like this because this is going to be quite a subtle thing uh, I don't have to uh, take away some of it so it doesn't become too too uh, wet. Uh, it's better to paint a little bit dry. So where to begin? Where to begin? Yeah. Uh, scary almost. Um, but as usual, it's just to start up. And that is the thing with painting. Somebody, sometimes it's really scary. When you feel I've done something nice, it's really scary to start doing stuff with it. But if we should be scared out of pushing on, never get anywhere. Anyway, so just go, go, go. Um, it's so it's tiny, tiny 
brush, see I drag, drag the color, that's the wrong color now, it's more green in there, so I guess I have to use more Prussian blue to tone it down, and what you do is just keep on toning, putting in new colors, and Finding the right hue and tone. If this is very in the dark and the light comes here, which I'm not going to put anything here now because it's going to mess it up when I'm painting. I'm going to paint this way, go down here and paint like this. Because you have to have a strategy or the whole thing just turns into a mess. And I remember when I started painting how important that was to, <laughs> to actually. Because it, uh, I stood for hours and hours and hours and I didn't have a good strategy, a strategy and I always messed it up. So. But I guess that is what you do in the beginning, even <laughs> it's the same with walking the way I said it's with painting, you have to learn it. Just drag it out a little bit and just these nice curls. There's a lot of things happening around her head here. And when it comes to the ear, I will kind of drag like that. some highlight on her nose there the highlights here that goes down like that and I use I use a broken yellow I call it broken I don't know what the right word in English but called uh, Naples yellow uh, with cup lock, it's perfect for, for some of the skin tones if you mix those two, two together. Everything I do, I figure out myself. I haven't actually learned from anyone but myself, so I have no idea actually. I used to remember more what the classics did, but I think it must be a little bit similar because when I look at old paintings it's usually the same type of brush strokes and colors I see in the different parts. So maybe it's a question about the intuition that you come to the same conclusions in the end. Uh, and like uh, the physicist Richard Feynman said in an interview I saw that when he was a child he started research and when he was like this and that age he has invented stuff that already was invented but he didn't know it so he kept on inventing things that already was invented or well, invented but discovered uh, and I guess that is what we all would do if we should start up from scratch. So, uh, I'll actually urge you to listen to Richard Feynman. He is an unbelievable physicist, beautiful person. It's unbelievable 
how his his uh, what he was thinking his his personality just beaming of happiness. Even the way he died was in an ironic way. <laughs> Maybe I should make a video playing a documentary of him in the background because I really love the way the spontaneity that the, the, this guy wasn't he wasn't smug, there was no bullshit, it was just total honesty and um, that is what I think is so beautiful for people like that. Okay, you guys get the idea, and I will film more later because I have to. Yeah, that was one. Yeah, so, okay. Hmm. This is really difficult. <clears throat> First, like three hours since last time I filmed, four hours maybe, and first I had it, then I lost it, then I had it again, then I lost it, and now it's kind of a mush, as I call it, because I have had so many corrections that I went into my usual neurosis where I can't let it go. <clears throat> that is always a problem because you just keep on going over the same thing over and over and over again until you can't really get any more color into it. But as it is now, it isn't that bad because it's a is a good start for the next time. So I could actually just leave it there and do something with it here. Some here. It's gonna be some more stuff behind here. And well there are certain things that are too drawn right now like the mouth and the lips. She has a very special face so she has a special nose and, and she has the, also in this painting, in this picture, she has this ironic smile which is in here in all the detail. It's small, you can't really see it on camera. So I have to work with all these super difficult nuances. I can only do that when it has dried. So, <clears throat> because now it just becomes more and more difficult to hit the jackpot. You know, the, 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 it's the micro expressions that creates this face and since it also licenses up just the fact that the chin here overlaps the nostril with only a bluish nuance that is almost a reddish in a cup like in blue. It's almost impossible to see it. And it's in here and it kind of overlaps a little bit and here too. So in the end it is all these micro things that will create that kind of ironic expression. There's kind of the cheeks are risen a little bit more there. There's a sh small shadow 
small tiny shadow here the camera that lifts it up a little bit <coughs> and all of these things together will create that subtle beauty so but now it's just well done overdone gone beyond the mark here too it's too light now too much light and not enough blue but as I know I start with a lazure this time and I can I push it down and I slowly drag it up again and that's how you go about back and forth back and forth and yeah I have to move the air a little bit and I have to move these so I have to move this a little bit and I'm going to start working down here get them all see in the chin comes like this uh -huh. and there's some blue in it right right now but I think it kind of has the same thing but without it's only the second layer of color so it isn't a catastrophe I know it's gonna be more so and then you see that it did a mistake and then the whole thing just turns to shit This is the battle I have with every painting and it can actually drive me quite nuts. Sometimes you just want to buy some caramel pudding and sit and watch TV series instead because it's so exhausting. But when you get into it, it is the most lovely thing in the world, painting. And it is Saturday night, and usually I would have gone out for a little while. But now I have this exhibition in like three weeks. And that is absolutely not an option. But it doesn't really matter because I really enjoy myself right now. See these beautiful goes down in like that. All these things has to be natural in the end so there will be a lot of reddish nuances inside there. Somewhere the colors from here is thrown into the face. Then it goes deeper in here. Well, it's not that bad when I look at it now. So I'm going to say, well, we can try something. See if we get some progression here. <coughs> I do wonder if it's going to be a little bit more. No, not really. Like this. Um, here. Maybe. Oh, do something with the ear. <coughs> Since I'm kind of on the right track. Now, there is some nice.
I haven't even touched these colors yet because the nuance is so uh, a different tone. This one maybe it's gonna be there. No. Well, a little bit smaller, maybe. <clears throat> the ear it's the same color as the rest now it's different but go behind make a shadow there's some greenish in here so I used the uh, I used the Prussian blue and uh, it's Naples and some other blue to give it that more fleshy green and these colors are kind of constantly going it's even some of it is at the nose there so you find the same things over and over again uh, yeah Called fleshy green. <laughs> so okay, but that wasn't what I was going to do. I'm gonna give this some. Keep that down a little bit, and then I pick it up again. stuff like this kind of scratching the surface to no, that was dumb okay whatever you see what I mean almost use it as a charcoal salt but salt there Mm-hmm, here's some hairs going down here. Also, the things that I don't know until suddenly it's like here too, it's blue. Because the skin is shining through, so like this and bluish and I have to let it melt. You can also use the back of the to make it more natural. And then you go in. Pick up what is behind. this so it becomes a little bit more natural like this I think that was quite nice not finished at all but on the right track <clears throat> Oh, 
I was watching some videos of David Kassan, Kassan, Kassan the other day, yesterday I think, and I see he's very systematic with his paintings. There are really no coincidences, and uh, but he also doesn't use so much color. They are not that. I've also seen them in real life. They are really good, but they're not that painted. They are like like more one surface. Um, but it's extremely nice, subtle, subtly done. I would have liked a little bit more punch to the colors, but I don't think you can get that expression by doing it because it will, the colors will overwhelm the natural feel to it. I am not that kind of painter and I have more freedom, I feel. Then again, he's a brilliant painter and his stuff is really takes a really long time to make. So you should go and watch his stuff. Very photographic. Right now he's doing this Holocaust series of Holocaust survivors. And I also had the honor to paint a Norwegian town witness, Samuel Steinman. That survived the Holocaust, it was Auschwitz and the camps when I was a young boy, young man. So it's funny that he did that too. I guess David is Jewish, I think. I'm not really sure, but he has more uh, direct connection to it. But many left of these people now, so it's very important to document their histories and so you will remember. Ah, yeah, kind of yeah, it's just uh, <sighs> I'm quite okay now. <clears throat> and when I get a little bit tired, my, my voice changed to more squeaky voice. Uh, so, yeah, it's too. It comes too much out still. But anyway, you see, you see my point. You just have to. Um, Okay, it goes in there, it comes in like that, here, it's too big, maybe, yeah, a little bit, and cut it a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe, let's see yeah. how it looks, uh, maybe a little bit too big, Anyway, I'm just going to keep painting, so, yeah. So, now it's this one. Um, very subtle face. And I have to work with that for a few hours. Uh, yeah. Then I start with a lazoo, lazoo, again, as usual, a little blue and red. Uh, 
shake it up. This sketch is probably the least uh, worked on. Um, there's a lot to do with it. So. Focus and hope for the best. I managed to fuck up the other night here, but I made it back, as I would say, to it. The mother became a little bit strange. I had to move the ear, I had to move a lot of stuff in it, and that sometimes happens because my sketching process isn't that accurate. So. But it also gives a lot to work with. So. I was in despair actually last night, but I used some hours today to get it back. I'm in this constant battle with my paintings and um, can be quite exhausting mentally especially now when I'm under pressure I have like 18 or 17 days to an exhibition and I need to finish a few paintings um, touch up some others so, there's a lot to do, but as I just do, I just start and then I keep going. This face is really quite huge, it has this very sweet round nose and I need to get that right. It's a little white here. All the neons just glides into that nose is actually wrong, so I need to get that right first, maybe. And then again, I just start and She actually looks more like the mother than the other kid. I think the other kid, the other girl, looks more like the father. And they have the same nose, actually. Um, it's not that. This kind of more well, sweeter. Sharp, sharp. That's how I painted it, and just need to get that right before I go any further. This more like that in a way, and a bit more that way. But anyway. <clears throat> the same special mouth as the mother. Kind of a uh, what's called an 
Aaronic month. Ironical. Fun. Definitely do some yoga. Kind of stiffening up. Standing for such a, such a long time. Every day. And I am like 8 kilos too heavy. So that puts a strain on my hips. So I should lose the weight, the lighter the body, the lighter the head, lighter for the hips, and the better I paint. It's strange, I feel I paint better when I get smaller. That's in the dialogue you have. I have inside my head when I'm trying to figure out stuff. There's a voice in my head that I'm discussing with. Uh, and it's very helpful because it makes me more conscious about my choices. And that's what happened yesterday. I became a little bit tired and I stopped listening to that voice and I just kept on painting until I just made a mess of it. Of course it's also important to get into the flow uh, but it has to be that in a dialogue when you stop making choices and when you stop making choices you tend to fuck up. And if you get frustrated, it's really difficult to find a way back. So you have to just tune out and maybe even wait to the day after or have a nap or something. Even watching TV for a while, or do something else, look in a book or whatever, and then you come back and you see it on a more objective level, because these things tends to tend to be extremely subjective, unbelievably subjective.
piece by piece, just take it apart in a way. Put it together. See, okay. It's deeper in there. And I have to get in with a little bit more reddish to bring it back up again. First I put on a blue, then I kind of go back and I go in some white and reddish and I drag it back up. Uh, if it becomes too reddish, I just push it back down with another color. It has a quite bluish tone, maybe in the cobalt chrome. I'm not sure. And then you start doing the directions, starting to drag to make it a more natural look. Drag. Here too, it's much more deeper. Deeper color. start to be more shape in it. Since the, the nuances here are so subtle, I am more careful how much paint I put on. She looks down. And yeah. Well, as many layers until it's finished, but maybe you get the point. This is not reddish. This is very little red in that face. It's small. Oh, it's red in the cheeks and stuff, but there we There's a lot of. So here, this is how I build, and I think some directions, nuances, everything. Of course, there's no light there because that is very in the shadow. a little bit but not that much so I just turn it all the way down turn this down and this one is actually getting coming further down maybe this is up uh, it's hard to tell right now so More. And like, um, oops. Mm -hmm. no. Too big. These uh, hairs and stuff, it's so subtle. It is unbelievably subtle. So totally fluid. Colors as to go into this. Yeah. Now I'm 
expression as impaired. <laughs> Taking away disturbance of the disturbance, and then I build the lights up here because that's where where it is most lights. Put the nose here and here. So I'm gonna start to do directions again. See how I use my. And these are things you figure out after a few years if you don't learn from someone. So you are lucky to learn from me because now I can jump over all that crap and go straight to the painting. Now it's also important because the background is also very subtle and it has a uh, greenish greenish tone with some a little bit of reddish in it it's quite difficult but it's more like a milky greenish thing a little bit deeper so I use my uh, Naples yellow some black and blue and reddish to create a more neutral tone and this is just the beginning because I it's just to tone it down I will tone it up or neutralize it and then I can go in with more heavier colors on top of that again and tone it down again. I started this painting in a different studio and it's clearly that my the colors and the light I have here is a little bit different because uh, they are the colors here is so much different in the painting so. that is why it's quite hard to Paint, paint it in my studio here and finish it in a different studio without almost going over the whole thing because different lights acts different tones so. and you can't paint in only yellow light because if you do that you will think that you are putting on a lot of warm colors but you know, when you take it out in daylight or something like that it's gonna look very very strange really and if you only use daylight and you take it into a room where only yellow light it's going to be way too warm so you have to have a mix between the two so. I don't use so much um, earthy colors in this painting like um, like Bernd uh, Dumbauer, uh, Van Dijk, but I used. Uh, and I said that's wrong, that should be green there. So I went far off the mark because I wasn't concentrating. And I took some of all. Burnt sienna and put into it and it changed the whole thing so that was a mistake I should have kept to this one the Naples yellow to create that tone there
And to make the shadow, I just go for some black, some blue, maybe some red, but most blue, black, and you know, white, of course. And I just neutralize it more and more. Since it's kind of greenish here, it can be some reddish in that shadow. And I can also drag it down here to turn this. Directions here can also be quite important. Go from here and pull it like this. Cut back to create it here. And there's a hairline. Not red. Anyway, it's just the beginning. But it is actually many times it's just even for me the color can be quite unclear. What is this? And then I just start to Basically, trial and error. In the end, we find a tone that is right. It's all fluid, so I have to think through it. She was a tiny man, she's actually 14 or 15 years old now. Just had a confirmation. She's calling all right.
Okay, I'm not gonna film anymore now. Yeah. So, maybe. So, I've been doing a lot of progress here. I'm building these figures, and it actually started to take shape. Uh, it has taken more time than I actually anticipated, but <clears throat> that's life. It always happens, so I have just to kind of use it. Uh, when I come to a certain point, it just tend to loosen up, and I just start to see the big picture. It's always the stage between the first sketch and when they start to become uh, get this more more holer in a way of say um, English and cleaner and you start to see all the mistakes you've done, you have corrected many of them and um, then you start to see the small ones it's like the closer you get to a finished work the more you can start seeing the small mistakes adjustments that actually make out a whole difference in the end um, so it's a lot of work left but I think I won't be able to do it in the time I left so just have to focus and shut down all my distractions I am the master of distraction so that is something I have to battle with rest of my life probably It's actually lighter. It has some highlights that I will do next time because I can't really put on some there's some folds here with extreme highlights that are actually in in the green and like um, um, well not green really uh, yellow with some Prussian blue, very vivid highlights, which I can only build when these other sort of things actually have dried. So it comes like him from here, from around, and creates that shape. Oh, it goes down. And you can see them here. There's some differences. There's some highlights over here. That's my actual wonder. Reddish, so. <coughs> Bluish. But, uh, there's always a, well, is a light here. It shines, kind of goes over here. And since that here is in that greenish, bluish kind of. It's, Will be some kind of warm color there, and there's also some warm here, and then it goes over all to the more bluish cold, which comes behind there with actually some. Again, this picture is going a lot in the cup lock 
what I was arraying red and blue with uh, Naples yellow um, to keep it down and of course a little bit of black in it. Is it what you're going to do is, is to take and just shove it down to the blue first and then you just bring it back up again with adding more lights and directions and see there are also some some very it's some light here so the hand will be brighter as I said before I did do the first sketch in a different room and therefore it has a little bit different hue uh, different colors in this light, in this room so I'm going to build some wooden walls here and that will both even out the sound there's a little echo in here which is annoying especially now when I'm making these videos and you see I just let it slide these colors into one another not any because of light some kind of different <coughs> cases you see now it's reddish and then it's kind of green bluish here Red there because it's far away. Next layer, I lasur all over it and I push it down and I bring up the things that I I want to bring up. So maybe put in the hand, give that the tone that it's supposed to have. Um, come down here and just make that lights and next time I do details in, in it it's just that in the fingers there's light up here Need to get that shape right so it's hard to see right now I think this is going to be a little bit more out <clears throat> I think it's okay if I explain what I'm doing, how I'm thinking. It will be easier for you to learn. See, now I'm making this line. There's a, it's a shadow going down here on the photo I'm using. But this line wasn't be as so strong in the end when I'm finished that it actually seemed like a line. It has just seemed like a gliding shadow. So it just glides over. Okay. There are no such thing as lines. There's only things that glide over from light to dark. You can't really know also on a atomic level where something ends and something starts well maybe you can or not that person but it's hard to know anyway it's hard to see and if you have too much lines it's gonna see stiff and and not feel very real also it's going to look very amateurish so try to there is a line here and it goes down like this there is a line, there is a shadow but after when I mold it many many times in the end it just becomes a 
and I set a gliding thing from light to dark. Now it's, and I can also use, I can see now directions, and I go in with some more bluish or maybe red. I put on some more. And I even it out. Then there was some Naples greenish. There are also some hair that falls down, so there will be some some shadows from the hair, and there will be also coming in from the sides, from the hairs that comes in like this. It's crosses over it, anyway. So just mark it, it's kind of how it will be. So, it's too much light, it's actually more in the blue. That's that's the problem. Too many times you are, your eyes are tricking you to believing that, that there are colors where there are no colors. And of course there's colors, but there aren't the colors you are believing you are seeing. Especially in shadows, it's very hard to, to see what kind of colors there are. But they are much of the same things, it just is the lack of light and lack of strength in the, or the warmth or whatever. That is the difference. And It's kind of dissolved there, and it's a little bit of shadow. No, not shadow, I mean light. Sorry. And there's actually some cobalt in it. I think, yeah. Uh, oh, fuck. My palette is now getting dirty. I've been painting for many hours. I even cleaned it a couple of times, but it becomes full of, I can't really find a spot which is not messed up, so but I'm going to finish for tonight anyway, so, so. I just put in the light now, and I put in the colors on top of that later, because they will um, be more shiny that way. Just to make the God, I'm so manic now. It's so hard to get away from it. People always ask me how long, how much time I use on every painting, and it's so annoying. First, I don't know. It's very hard to know. It takes a long time. So, I wouldn't even bother thinking about it. So, it's a good beginning. Anyway, of course, this is even darker than up there. Yeah, that's a shadow. Oh. Now it's kind of reddish in there, so it becomes blue here. Again, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. And behind here now, probably because of the light coming from a different source, there is some reddish behind here. And 
of the water start melting together. So, and very cold lights there. You can see how I can see them afterwards. But, um, sometime, somewhere in this this painting is going to be some real punch to the light. So. Um, so the difference in the tones will be on the whole scale. I think my paintings are very honest in the way it's painted. It's no, I'm not trying to, I don't even know how really. So it's always a battle. And it tends to make the paintings quite honest. And even sometimes a little bit naive, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it's hard to explain what honesty in painting is, but it is more like I'm not trying to create art. I'm not trying to to create fancy brush strokes or anything like that. I'm just trying to, in a way, make it the best I can. And these aesthetics in the brush strokes tend to uh, just show up in that process. I do know there are some artists that are so occupied of being artists that they almost force themselves to do paintings that are artistic or brush strokes that are Try to make art. Just try to try to create. Try to get get it right. Try to push yourself. So it's almost like an author who is desperately trying to make his. Roman interesting or exciting and trying to create a story instead of letting the story come to them. And a book like that can never be good because there's no real honesty in it. And I think you can be 
transfer to painting as well. So. There are some Norwegian artists that desperately are trying to paint in some kind of um, Paint in some some time that isn't here anymore. It's too romantic. It's too, uh, and I don't mean, mean that necessary the motifs, but I'm thinking about the the way they blur things out and the way it's always going to be so fucking exhausted with pathos and all that shit, you know, there's no irony in it, there's no, there's no um, humor, there's no realism, there's no gravity, you know. Truth is like gravity in a way keeps you nailed to the ground both mentally and physically of course it's like when uh, Kevin Spacey in a movie called The Big Kahuna, a brilliant movie by the way, tells a guy that when he stops believing in people, he just say, I don't believe you, Bob. And uh, I guess that is. trying so fucking hard, just be. Food. I wanna actually watch an episode of Soul. Never call Soul. That TV series, brilliant. The spin-off of um, Breaking Bad. See true dress, it's kind of silky, and yeah, I'm gonna do some more, but before I quit, but now at least you can see a little bit how I think, and of course you will see the end result sooner or later anyway. So. Sorry for my video, videos being so long and boring, but kind of gives you a sense of the work that goes into it. And it's a lot of work. Many, many hours. Hmm. Working on the room for a while. Um. 
and putting in the first layer and uh, it's nice to get the whole thing in again it's nine in the morning that's my usual schedule and I'm getting tired you probably can see my face <clears throat> you can hear my voice So first layer, and then I go in and start uh, working on top of that layer where it has dried. to each other all these different corners. taken in my last studio and sad actually but, but this one is bigger so it's not in the middle of a city like the last one but maybe that's a good thing because you get more peace of mind and all that just gonna step out the door and go to a pub. Actually, I had to walk a little bit. So. Oh. 
So, it gives more depth when you're getting these, these things. There's uh, a line here, sharp line actually, because it's a wooden thing put into a brick wall and it's painted over it. But this is actually wood and it's a little bit different texture. And I guess I just have to take that out to the paint later. Very certain lines here that will go on because it's a window post here. So it will be, I will then work more like this and like this. Next time, next layer to make these make these lines that goes up, but to make them also melt into each other. And that is actually how the thick color that will be in, in the front here makes a depth physically because it's also not just a flat surface, it is actually a thick some places thick layers that is like or relief. Mm -hmm. Just put it on. pushes the face in because this is very very softly painted because it's inside it's not really detailed and when I then push the light here both sculptory and light it just pushes things into place so it's a very good thing So on many levels you think you think like a sculptor at the same time as you are a painter. That's why sculpture and painting is actually for me anyway one basically one side of the same coin. I'm not after very photographic uh, surfaces where there are no texture, just to get it as photographic as possible. I'm after a painted painting at the same time as it is figurative. Look at Lambert's paintings, you know. They are photographic, but they are very natural. And that's because of the paint. Keep grabbing your attention and sense out 
the sense of motion and shape and light and all that. And many good but boring figurative artists and the ones who are really good is the ones who can combine those two things the painted and the sculpture. I'm going to start to do sculptures again. Okay. I think I'm going to bed now. Sleep seven or nine, eight hours, then trip to the gym and then start working again. So there's some paint, black paint on this. This one's here too. Some spots of dirt that keeps it life. Okay. So, working with this face. Difficult. This is where everything becomes difficult, actually. Mm.
very important to concentrate about the small points like that little dot on the nose little thing on the nostril that gives it that more ironic look uh, little spot on the air all these small things that just creates <coughs> shape That's the problem, you start treating your brain is starting to fool you. You look at it, you see one thing. You look back on it and you see another thing. And you keep on fighting back and forth. You can't really decide. Is it in? Is it out? Is it more bent over? Is it less? So. I guess that's the story of my life. But I've decided one thing from now on, which is every painting 
that comes out of my studio that will be worked to the maximum and my life and my time is basically going to go into these things painting getting better which gives the greatest pleasure training healthy food writing and maybe even maybe if everything else goes right way learning to play the fucking piano I want to have the rest of my days in existence in a state of flow not in a state of stress oh this is actually quite nice now wow hit the jackpot boom Okay, just keep working and um, we see if I fuck it up and we can see the result later. <coughs> that face started to get funny. It's not finished yet, but I think I it took kind of took out his own life today. It isn't totally correct compared to the photograph yet, but it is kind of getting there. And I hope if I let it dry now, I can uh, go in with the last details. <coughs> Hopefully. So. <coughs> Everything is taking more time than I thought, and that is a horrible experience, to put it mildly, because it seemed like I'm not going to be able to finish some of them, other paintings I'm going to have to my exhibition so I might just exhibit them a little bit unfinished and then if they get sold just take them back in for a touch up Yes. 
me so much mentally, so I'm starting to get exhausted. Had some problems starting off today, and I almost had a feeling about giving up. It's not really me, so I keep going. And um, people don't see what I see, anyways. But yeah, I think this phase became quite fun. And uh, but getting some few more details because I was fighting back and forth for a very long time until in a way it became, became alive and it started to live its own life and I started to laugh because she had such a funny, actually more funny expression there than in, in the original photo. So probably added some of, some of my own features into it without knowing it. It's very typical that you do that. She looks more grown up in a way in the painting and the photo. Uh, and since this paint, it makes this light, this comes out and get you. Uh, it's a beautiful photograph I'm working from, but when it becomes paint, it becomes very what's called luminous. And um, really comes alive. That's a very nice feeling. So yeah. I was actually going to go over a whole thing today and I just hit the wall. Five more days to work, and it's not much. Uh, but This is the cup lock. It's a very nice red. Uh, has a lot of life. And I recommend it. Alizarine is also called. Alizarine.
put in some black and some uh, some Prussian blue, and I kind of tone it down a little bit so it becomes greener. change stuff like that you have to paint all over again in a way. <coughs> so the hair is putting on a very nice shadow. How false comes with the other layer. Here, here, here. And the shadow kind of explains a lot of the shape of this. And then there comes some here. And I have to enhance it again. This is what is time consuming because you get to a point and you think you have it and then boom, you don't have it after all. And you keep fucking with it and you go back and forth and kind of drives you nuts in the end. You keep on seeing new things, new colors. Okay, some really warm yellow in the hair because of the light. So I just put that on like that, kind of luminous. Yellow it creates a lot of motion. Kind of with a with a red hair, it kind of creates a nice sense of some motion. I put a highlight on top of the color. Boom! You have some hairy stuff that comes alive. Mm -hmm. it a little, put in some red, some yellow, so it kind of becomes a nice contrast to the light parts that you fill it up with the same kind of color and you get some some complementary 
gradient contrasts and stuff like that. Two, two. So. And so. It's actually cobalt blue. And cobalt there. Probably will reflect some of this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some alserine up there. The skin. There's a highlight that we can see it. Needs to be a little bit more vivid. To have some punch to it. So now I see that the shadow is more bent. So I drag the shadow over to that point where they meet each other. And I kind of drag it right into the white. So I get that Rembrandt effect in a way. And um, the shadow feels like it's naturally falling on the cloth and not is it? kind of part of it, but it is on top of it. And I enhance it a little bit with, again, black. No, actually, I need some yellow in there for some reason. Like this.
kind of it's the same procedure like I did. Just first you push it down, then you can pick it up again. that hasn't dried yet so I should be more careful the shadows is in uh, Persian blue the highlights are uh, reddish means that these colors start to complement each other. This looks like shit, so it also has to kind of flow together a little bit because if not it <coughs> becomes too stiff. And we don't want that. It's so white, so it has kind of stayed down. I think Not too much color, and the light actually dies instead of being luminous. It's very hard. Uh, thing actually, because you. The difference between one and the other is quite small. When you become a little bit manic, you start just to stop thinking and you start pouring in a lot of color. Uh, sometimes it is. Maybe fucked up. Now I think that might be good. Stay like 
Jones. so wet on the wall. People must stay away from them on the exhibition. sketchiness and you are over in a different realm in a way.
feeds and comes in there here. It's really scary now because we really have no time for fuck ups. That's so annoying. Some of these details there. Right now, it is more um, out there. Let me see. Get that but on the left. Hmm? Some more blue there. Cobalt, I think I see, and a mix of cobalt and Prussian, maybe. It's hard to say. See what happens. Brushes quite fast. So Difficult.
compression right there. Take it like that, a lift. sometimes so difficult they don't want to work with you start working against you it's hard to see exactly what color it is and then boom you do a mistake and then you have to paint over it to keep on doing that back and forth so, so. Sometimes I wish I didn't use so much color on the answers. There's too many factors, so many factors when I paint. Uh, painting classic figurative with uh, Impressionist palette, which sometimes can lead to quite difficulties. Then sometimes the colors are nice, but then it gets boring. Nothing is happening. I need some more, whoosh, more zest. Big fat. Of green and yellow and blue, right? There, to give it some. Like that. 
this one. Whoosh. And do now it's like uh, the nuances here are just extremely subtle and they are somewhere between green blue different hues quite difficult to see very subtle and also the shape is important the arm mustn't be too thick so I try to use the background to find the right thickness And when I have found it, I start kind of doing like this, mold it together. Um, there's a line here, but it's better explained when it's a little bit more light in the background. And then I'll just want to go away. 
Yeah. <clears throat> that line is difficult because I'm not sure which it's some reddish in it. I can use some black, but it is very subtle. And this is the kind of lines that Leonardo da Vinci used to strengthen the shapes. Very subtle lines. Uh, this is actually not a line, it's a shadow. But of course, that is what lines like this explains. Um, it's hard to get it to become natural. It's too much or too little, too much or too little. And it's so time consuming and it is Oh. That's why from now on I'm going to always have enough time on every painting so I don't come into this horrible situation over and over again. When I have to stand here like 16 hours to finish it and then sleep and then just start to working again. It's kind of, I go into this box and, and it's not bad really, but I've been doing nothing else for three weeks in a row and it's hard to get to you. You know, I've not been social. Been to the gym a couple of them, been stretching, not too hard training because it takes too much energy when I'm working that much. I'm getting old, so <laughs> no. not really. Even in here. Gliding over. So see, I just because I don't really know. And now I've been putting in some red hair. Actually, that light will come from here, and then explains. And when I do like this, kind of glide into each other, it becomes a very natural. neon circles from light to dark because now the colors are crossing into each other and that's what I need to do here also down here and it's going to take at least one and a half hour just to do the arm and then I have to let it dry and do it probably once more because There is a limit to how much paint can absorb in one go. Ah, oh. you know what's more correct? I'm working with the whole thing. I was actually going to work with the whole thing, but I didn't get that far. Even here, there's a tiny bit lighter back there and there. And it's almost impossible to see. You have to have trained eyes to understand it. So that's the that's when it becomes also intellectual because 
you see a problem and you just don't use your eyes anymore, you also use your brains. And, um, so you jump out around the flow, you become conscious, more conscious of what you do. Now, so I have to lift this up and then suppress this one. And I also have to do that here. And these two are colliding very much into each other. Luckily, there comes some light from there to there, so I put in some reddish, which will glide very well in with the, the backbone. And now this is wet, so I can do like this, cross over, and I do it again. And I pounce it a little bit. And we go in another direction. And now you see it kind of falls in. And behind here too is a little bit more blue, greenish color. So that will also help to enhance the more reddish. If you see now, now it falls in. And then I go in here and I get back up again. So. I really hope you share these videos if you like them because it takes me a while, some time to make them. And I really appreciate that people learn something from it, get something out of it. So please tell me about it. Funny thing working for so many hours is that 
it doesn't seem like 14 hours or 15 or whatever I've been awake now working because you get into the flow and time stands still so it all, it's kind of it feels actually like I'm, I'm out of time for 14 hours <laughs> and um, and um, trying to get as much done as possible. I will not be able to finish all the details you know, for the exhibition, or so I will. It becomes a nice painting, so I will exhibit it, and if somebody buys it, I will just say I need it to have it in a studio for a week or something to give it the last bang. Um, usually there is no problem. It's expensive paintings, so... But all the works that goes into it, you need to get some money for and the framing is very expensive framing so I like the framing so and there's going to be more there is the yeah okay doing enough now you get the point so yeah Touch up time. Now I just work all over the place. Um, I come to a point, and that's a good thing. It would have been better to have more time to do that, but right now. Surfaces creates a believable logic. Um, it's quite important. It doesn't really have to be perfectly painted all over. There. It can be some places can kind of line out more into the more abstract. strengthen it. This also, I'm going to take one actually of the same woman or girl and I'm going to paint it um, this size, just uh, a square, maybe even bigger and I'm going to go all out like in uh, Vermeer's The Art of Painting. So I'm looking forward to that. Just to 
see how far I can take every detail. Sometimes if you start to do more detail at one place, you just have to keep going all over and you just have to, I don't know where to stop. with how the lights have turned out there. It's very vivid, very intense. Actually quite beautiful with all the greens and the reds and the yellows. How they really make makes it come alive. to 16 hours every day and I keep forgetting eating I just eat some fish and eggs and fruit and, and I start losing weight that's fun but I lose muscle mass too so it's not the right way to do it like eating like 1500 calories a day and work 16 hours it's not really a smart way to lose weight What I also do is that I have a meal right before bed that has some healthy vegetables and fish. And fish makes you sleep, so that's good. Something else better to do, that's a little touch up, just Give it a little bit more room. Volume, sorry, volume. Um, so. It's quite nice because it's almost sliding to the hand. Bugs. And it's quite a nice effect.
difference in the color. Okay, with that volume. Sometimes when you start on things like that, just get to the point where you regret starting at all because then you see something else and you just keep on dwelling into it. The thing is that I need a stronger line down there because that's Nice because it pushes it, pushing it in. So I put this on. I think I'm gonna be okay. So there. A little bit more blue. Just love this so intimate, so personal. This is personal.
going to turn into a crisis. Um, stop. Okay. I really need to stop. Stop. Mm, let me see. Medicines. Actually, I have accepted this, but now I just can't accept it anymore. And that's a problem.
it doesn't have to be um, all over the, the camera, the picture, because then you, because if you have a lot of, if you only have, if you don't have all the colors and all the places in some sense, uh, not the same, clean, clean, not, not clean, but that you have some of the, when I went away and I looked at it, I saw that this was too red compared to the rest. So I had to go back and put in some, um, some more of the green and maybe a little bit yellow and even, even some red actually to so that it's not dead in a way. There's not much you need, it's just a movement, just a little touch to create some dynamic feeling in it. exhibition and keep kind of trying to get started and there's always some distractions that keeps you from getting into the depth of the process and then in the end you are working like a madman and it's good way to live. It's very stressful, very unnecessary. And now, I couldn't kill less. After three or four weeks with only painting, no socializing, nothing. I couldn't care less about the things that distracts me. A TV series, or going out, or too much training, stuff like that. I don't care. 
and it's a very nice place to be. I want to find them on some leaves, salt leaves, uh, strategically. And then I'm going to move down. This can be like that, it doesn't matter. It's quite in the dark, so I need to go in like that. And do a little bit down there. And I want to call it for now for the exhibition. I'm not going to sign it unless it gets sold. I want it back to my. I'm gonna take it back to my studio anyway, even if it gets sold to give it a little touch up. start doing some live model and see if I can find a girl that can sit for a sculpture and increase the It's a work I do.
one. Go on and do it. Spike. so strange on my YouTube channel because I have so many videos and just a few of them I've seen so many times I don't get it because there's no I don't know why they don't better than the other ones in any way Maybe that looks better. Is that okay? Let's take too much noise. Kind of noisy. Calm it down by crossing over like this. Calm it down. Making it fall in. Here too, just. Make it more sketchy. And yeah, now it fell into the background. That's better. I think. Okay. So, then I move to the side. And yeah. Okay. So here I am again. Um, I kind of finished this one and I think it became quite nice. Uh, maybe need some more light here to see it better. 
Uh, I think that detail became quite fun and uh, I worked a lot with the textures and the uh, colors and uh, and everything in this. It's uh, been a real struggle. Uh, so you see how I build it and how important it is to, to keep on working and pushing and pushing and pushing and in the end it becomes like a sculpture and um, there's like a relief and uh, that's what I'm after so I think the composition is nice uh, the portrait likeness is so and so but it looks like them so that would be good enough for now maybe I take it back in for a touch up and do some more but I will see yeah anyway here it is finished today Okay, remember to subscribe to my channel. Hey YouTube, uh, welcome to my channel. I, if you haven't been here before, I just finished uh, a new painting that I actually had on my um, last exhibition. I just took it home and I worked some more with it because, and I had to put on a finishing furnace. I went over it a little bit and I just want to show you some of the textures, how it's painted and uh, yeah. You see what I do to build the lights is the same thing. I kind of tend to build a lot of textures. It's a very cool face, it turned out very nice. And you can see all the textures I work with and and um, all the brush strokes that I use to build up all the different points of light that makes it into a you see here it's very thick um, and yeah that I guess it's the classical way to do it to get that sense of sculpture in it I went over this face and I think it turned also out quite well um, yeah it's quite bluish it's a little bit uh, more red in it in real life than you see here in the in the let's see it's a third by lens that have auto scan maybe uh, it's a little bit more as I say warmer in reality and I think I also want to show it with a frame I use very nice framing because I think it's a good idea to hold the painting like in your hand in a way or lock it in as you are looking through a window and you get more depth and you show where it ends and where it starts and I like the aesthetics of it I like the pathos of these frames and also if I could actually ma got made classical classical uh, framing like you see in the big uh, museums I would have done that but you don't get it anymore this too became quite nice and it's a little bit rough rough painted it's not that detailed in the dress and stuff I just use a lot of brush strokes so I concentrate about the faces and to get that over right but well it's two files uh, it's one file from sketch to finish sketch and then it's this this one and you will find the second 
second video or the first video in the end of this this um, video after it's finished uh, so I hope you enjoy the process and get something out of it so <clears throat> as usual I would ask you to share my videos and subscribe to my channel you can also donate on my channel if you like to give something back uh, so with this I rest my case and I hope as I said that you get something out of it okay